So, uh, hello, Silicon Valley. Hello. Uh, hello, San Jose State. Ah, oh, it's better. Hello, Spartans. That's the school spirit. So, uh, it's hot out. My name is Rob. I organized Idea to IPO. We've been holding events in Silicon Valley for many, many years. We launched officially on February 1st, 2010. At that time, we had no members and no events on our channel. At this stage, we have over 300,000 members among all our meetup groups all around the world. We've organized, promoted, and produced over 3,200 events. By any standard, by any measure, we're the most active, most prolific startup event organization in the history of Silicon Valley, bar none. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we organize venture capital panels, legal workshops, networking events, and more. We have an event every day of the week, seven days a week. So check out our schedule at ideatoipo.com. We have many partners that help us do what we do. Law firms, venture capital firms, angel investor groups, incubators, accelerators, colleges, universities, and lots of other players in the Silicon Valley startup ecosystem. Today, we're grateful to San Jose State University and the Lucas College and Graduate School of Business for hosting us at this beautiful venue on this wonderful campus. So let's hear it for San Jose State and Dr. Anu Basu. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Great to see you all this afternoon. And we are, I'm a professor here at San Jose State. And we have uh, organized a lot of events here as well as part of the Silicon Valley Center for Entrepreneurship. So in fact, we have two upcoming events this semester um, that are finalized on September 12th and October 17th in the Student Union Theater. And our events are to inform and inspire our students and our community to learn about entrepreneurship and start their own startup. So I'm really excited to be partnering with idea to ipo this afternoon and to have gary jinx here to speak to us and yeah looking forward to it so thank you. Right. so our local mission is to support entrepreneurs here in silicon valley but our global mission is to democratize entrepreneurship and innovation all around the world to that end we maintain a robust <laughs> youtube channel youtube.com slash idea to IPO. Go check it out. We have tons of videos there. This rich, valuable content is available on demand, anytime, anywhere, totally free of charge. Our partner in this endeavor is Tim Jeggers of Jeggers Films, one of the top professional videographers in Silicon Valley. So let's give it up for Tim. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, everybody. So I'll keep it real brief. Uh, my name's Tim. I've been doing videos with Rob for, what, seven? A long time. Long time. Mm -hmm. Long time now. Um, I specialize in creating video content. I also create branding content. Uh, my goal is just media content, telling stories that way. So mostly what I do is I work with individuals, organizations, businesses, identify what their goals are, what they're trying to accomplish through content such as media, identifying how to reach their audience and how to make stuff catered to that. And uh, <coughs> I like taking pictures and photography and music. And just want to remind everyone, if you do have questions, for the sake of the video, this mic is to go to my camera so that we can hear you and have a nice, clean video that has good sound. So please refrain from just yelling out questions. If you have questions, raise your hand. We'll bring the mic to you. And then that way, people can use this video as a learning resource, because I'm sure you've all got lots of great feedback and input. And with that, I will pass it back to Rob. Thank you. As I mentioned, we have an event seven days a week. And we're doing, actually, an in-person networking event seven days a week. We have one tonight at the Hyatt Regency Santa Clara. It's hosted by my colleague, Joe Ashwood. Joe, let's give it up for Joe. <laughs> Okay, like Rob said, we have a networking event tonight at the Hyatt Regency Santa Clara. Um, I hope to see at least half of you there. <laughs> it's a good networking event for everybody, and you know, it's always good to meet more people, build your network more, establish yourself more, and diversify. Uh, 
You don't have to be 21. <laughs> um, we, now it's time for community announcements. Uh, we have a couple members of our community here with an announcement. Uh, let's hear it for Diana. Applause. Hi, I'm Diana. I'm here to, <clears throat> to join Click. It's the startup accelerator for corporate partnership. For the last six years through my company, the Corporate Accelerator Forum, I've been working with corporates who partner with startups in order to move faster. Now, we want to help startups partner with corporates in order to move bigger. Uh, come see me, I'd love to tell you more about it. I want to set aside a few talk. minutes for anyone in the audience who has an announcement. <laughs> maybe you're looking for an opportunity. Maybe you have an opportunity available in your organization. Maybe you're looking for an internship. Maybe you're looking for a co-founder, CTO, developer. Maybe someone in this room <clears throat> wants to talk to you. Maybe you want to talk to them. So, uh, is there anyone who has an announcement about anything? And I can bring the mic. On. All right. Actually, do, do you want to come on up? That's okay. You're, you're camera shy, right? Yeah. All right. Uh, let's hear it for Sharon. Hi, everyone. I'm Sherry Matthews, CEO and founder of uh, AI Tech UK. Uh, we run research, uh, development, and a lot of advisory services, and we built some cutting edge uh, technology as well. So we're here to sort of scale and uh, partner with ambitious people who are uh, into climate tech, into regulation, compliance tech, and uh, want to build something ethical and uh, groundbreaking for future. So open to collaboration, partnership, and even education. So I deliver guest lectures to high performance uh, UK universities as well. And I mentor a lot of startups as well. So here to see what I can add value into this ecosystem. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Rob. All right. Okay, any more announcements? <coughs> going once, going twice. Oh. Uh, I want to acknowledge there's some students uh, from is it Switzerland or Germany. All right, let's hear it for the folks from Switzerland or Germany. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you guys enjoy the event today. So uh, we're gonna get started. Uh, here's the agenda for the rest of the afternoon. We're gonna listen to uh, a slide presentation from our featured speaker. It's gonna be dynamic, compelling, insightful, brilliant, and entertaining. I hope so. Right? Uh, afterwards, we're gonna listen to pitches from pre-selected entrepreneurs. We're gonna pitch to Mary and get feedback. Uh, there's still time to sign up to pitch, so if you get inspired, come see me and we'll work it out. So without further ado, I want to introduce our featured speaker today. He is an entrepreneur, an investor, a thought leader, and yes, a dynamic speaker. So let's give it up for Gary Jinks. All right, oh, I got my own, I'm, I'm wired. All right, well, hey, I'd like to thank everybody for starting. So this is going to be a discussion. Not a, not a lecture. So I'm just going to talk about stuff, and I want to get your feedback. I want you to talk, ask questions, get engaged. I hate to have to pull on you, then it, you know, count on you, know, point at you, and call you, and then it gets awkward. <laughs> All right, so let's get ahead started here. Okay, like Rob said, so a little bit about my background and how I got here. So <clears throat> I got into the Silicon Valley in 1981 via Ford Ord, uh, which is why I was in Germany. I was over there in the Army. I got out, and as I was trying to transition, I got hired the very next morning when I went to the unemployment office. So I had zero time to transition. I went to work for a large defense contractor. I spent 20 years creating innovation, primarily developing combat vehicles and things of that sort. Um, so I've done innovation my whole career. In 2004, I left the corporate world for good. I left a little bit in... 1999 and started my first startup in, I worked my first startup in the uh, dot com. But in 2004, I launched GLJ Group. And since then, I've launched three companies. The first one was GLJ Group, which is focused on creating and taking innovation to market. The second one I launched was in 2011, and that was South Valley Angels to fund that innovation that we were trying to take to market. And the third one I launched was really last year, 18 months, which was Scale Up Stream which is for everyone to be able to find what they're looking for in the innovation world, for startups to find investors, advisors, vice versa, corporates to find them, all these. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But if you're an entrepreneur today, I'd recommend go check it out. That's scaleupstream.com. You, you can pitch to investors. 
with no, nothing in your way. Okay, so that's my background. I've been doing this for a while. I've worked with over a thousand startups one by one. Launched the first corporate innovation center in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia in 2016. We launched 21 startups in 18 months. So uh, I've been around doing this for a little while. Oh. Um, that's going to be tricky on the clicker here. Okay, so let's talk about the startup model. I know business is business, so there's two different types of fundamental models. There's a traditional business model, you know, start your own business, and there's a startup model, which is sort of like start your own business. So well, what's different? What's the difference between a startup model? Does anybody understand what the fundamental difference is between what's referred to as the startup model and just starting a business? Who wants to try that? Any, any thoughts? Yeah, go ahead. Excuse me? Startups are designed to grow. Well, I hope your bus traditional business is designed to grow, too. Yeah. Not no. The same, not the same rate. Ah, that's part of it. Speed to market. But the fundamental difference is traditional model is, is based off debt. You go in, you get a small business loan, you get a loan, you grow, you go to a controlled environment, you grow as fast as your debt allows you to grow. The startup model almost traditionally is on alternative funding. Not necessarily investors, but it's more, it's non-traditional funding. And that's fundamentally, if you look it up, that's the biggest difference is how they get their money. And it's presumed that the startup entrepreneurs will be taking more risk because they're using high risk methods to fund themselves and so forth and so on. In the old days, the Steve Jobs days, the Bill Gates, the Mark Andreessen's, they were just kind of a little crazy. Um, now, it's a, now it's a career field. Everybody wants to be either an entrepreneur or a influencer, right? Okay, so that's the fundamental difference. So we're going to talk a little bit about, about the definition on that. Okay, if you read Lean Startup, which is now becoming an old book, <clears throat> this is the definition. Notice in that definition, it doesn't say anywhere, no one on there say start a company, does it? Hmm, so what if you just take an idea and just license it, prove it out, demo it, or not even license it, just demonstrate that it works and have a corporate and buy in two and a half years. Never became a startup. So anyway, it's, the, keep in mind, there's a difference between innovation and being a startup. A startup is a method of doing it based on certain things as we all use the startup world. So now, we're going to get into the details of what makes that different. Part of what you said was speed to market. Why is it unique? Because, like you said, rapid growth is part of it. What makes it unique is you're going to get private funding which will allow you to achieve rapid growth. If you have a debt, if you get a million dollar loan, that monthly payment's going to be a little steep. That's going to cut into your cash flow. But if you get a million dollar investment, all of your money can go to the creation of what you're doing. That's what makes it different. In most cases, you'll likely get acquired in this model. Some of you may go IPO. Some of you may be a nice unicorn that gets acquired for $16 billion or whatever the case may be. Um, but that's traditionally the market. That's, that's the critical path on the startup model. So that's what you're trying to do. Get funded, grow rapidly, and probably get acquired most of the time. That ending, it can flex. All right, so a couple key things here. It's about innovation, not invention. Rarely do startups invent anything. In fact, I would argue the Silicon Valley hasn't invented anything since the chip, the microchip. Google didn't invent the browser or search engines. Apple didn't invent the computer. When I was here in 1981, there was over a thousand computer companies in the South Bay, from San Francisco to San Jose. A thousand! All, most of them, a lot of them even had their own operating systems. It was an interesting time. Today, how many are there? One. There's Apple. IBM's not really a computer company anymore. HP's moved out. There's another one. <clears throat> okay, so it's about Innovation. So don't, when you're talking to investors, you're not selling that you're inventing the next best thing. In fact, the easiest way to get funded is to have better, faster, cheaper. I can show you that today it's 10, we can do it in a second, and if we do that, it's a billion. It, you know, inventing something, nobody really knows what's coming out the other end. It's, you know, it's uncertain. So it's about the, in, innovation, not invention. The second, funding is a process, not a meeting. Every, so many entrepreneurs think that I'm going to go to this pitch and this pitch is it. It's the end of the world. I'm going to get funded to this pitch. Unless you're walking in talking to your cousin or somebody that you've already made a lot of money in as an investor, that's probably not going to happen. Um, on average, you're going to probably, we were talking earlier, on average, you're probably going to reach out to 58 investors, meet with 40 of them to find your first lead investor. And after that, it's going to probably take you on average 12 and a half weeks to close that note. 
So if anybody's looking for funding, I was talking to somebody earlier and they're saying, well, I mean, I've reached out to 50 people already. Oh, you're only eight short. You're almost there. <laughs> so those are two big things in the model. It's, it's a process, it's a journey, and it's more about innovation than it is invention. Any questions? Okay, we'll keep going. So now you've probably seen something like this somewhere when you've Googled startup models and stuff. This is a classic life cycle for a startup model. First phase, idea cre creation. Those of you that are working startup stuff, I guarantee that 90% of you were probably in that stage. There may be somebody that's come out of it, but most of you were preparing, getting ready to go and do your stuff, okay? That's also called bootstrapping, which is probably how you're paying for it. It's also called the three Fs. Do you, does everybody know what the three Fs are? Outstanding, there he is. That means somebody in your family is funding you and helping you do it, or you're doing it on yourselves. Because you haven't done enough for anybody else to fund you because nobody knows you, your family is funding you because they know you. And this might get, a, get you a job and out of the house. No. <laughs> anyway, so that's how we're looking at it. Now, as you move down this line, you're going to recognize there's a lot of terms. Market entry, seed stage, pre-seed, series A, all these things. I want you to think about this sta in the stage in really simple, very simple. Oh, I keep forgetting here. There we go. Preparation, validation, and growth. For reference, this might take 10 years, however long it took you to get to the end of where you finally launch your startup. This is likely going to be an 18 month, 12 to 18 month window. Because what you're trying to, you're, you know, you're trying to validate everything. So this would be your go-to-market. You get your angel funding, you go to market, then you get your VC funding. So if you think about it in those steps, you don't get caught up in what's a pre-seed, what's your definition of a pre-seed, what's seed to you. So it's simple. You're going to prep, you're going to prepare to get ready, you're going to go out and validate it, and you're going to grow or not. <laughs> now, what's that mean? Today, when we do our pitch practices, what we want to do in this first stage is you want to convince people you're talking to, whether that's people you want to join your team, whether that's partners you want to join in, into the, the big picture cause, or in most cases, investors you're trying to fund. All those people, you'll need to be able to communicate that you understand the opportunity. A $38 billion market is not an opportunity. It's simply a number doesn't mean there's any opportunity for you at all there. It's just not. So you need to understand what the opportunity, which means what are the trends? Why now? How did you get to the vertical market you're getting going after? So statistically, the number that they're throwing around the internet today is 42% of startups fail because of timing. Too early, too late, whatever the case may be, 42% failed at timing, which meant they couldn't get their clients that they were working because they, they weren't. And I've got, I, understand, I have a belief on why that happens because all startups focus on one thing, the problem. The focus should be on the future. What's the future look like? If you put your head in the ground and just focus on solving a problem, when you stand back up with that, you're probably more likely solving today's problems. So the biggest thing is understanding where the future is going. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But that's a biggie, and that's where the validation comes in. In the MVP, you build the product you think you want. You understand the opportunity, you have a plan, you know what it costs, you can communicate that intelligently, and you can, you have some proof, something that proves that your team can do what they want to do. Now in the communicating piece, I'll talk about later, but tomorrow morning I've got a class at 9 a.m. online on scale up stream, and it's called how to talk like a CEO. Not a sales rep, not a designer, not a developer, not suing accounting, but talk like a CEO with strategic things. So at the end of the discussion, we, we understand where we're going. So, okay, so now, once you understand all those things, then the next step, it's going to be to validate you have the right idea, 18 months, right product, right price, and you can scale. That's what's expected to happen in the milestone. That's what the angel investors who funded you are going to expect you to finish and have the right product, right price. And if you do that good, you go to the next stage, and it's all about growth and revenue after that. In most cases, as in most startups are going to get acquired somewhere in this window in most cases. The ones out here, those are the ones you'll hear about on the news. The ones that get acquired here, you may never hear about them. They got bought for $40 million. But you, you worked for 18 months, two years, and somebody buys you for $40 million, you go on to the next project. There's nothing wrong with that model either. So anyway, that's the model. Any questions on this? Keep it, just keep those, those pieces. Yes, go ahead. Oh, hold on. Where's the microphone? Am I supposed to wait for a microphone to show up over there? You can also just repeat his question and your answer, if that's 
It doesn't matter. We're all oh, either way, go ahead. Go ahead. In which state should I, should I think about uh, incorporating? Um, you're going to have to incorporate more than likely before you get your first round of funding because that's really the only way you can do a convertible note to get to do something. So the reality of it is, is you have to have something to work. So you have to have sort of an entity to write a convertible note to. Because you're probably not going to give out shares, so you don't have to go through that hassle. Um, the reality of it is, is you have to be incorporated before you can give away any shares at all, because you don't have shares to give away into that. Now, you might find some early stage investors who say, hey, I don't care about incorporation, we'll do a note, we're going to do it to whatever. But normally you'll have to have a, an entity, because that's what they're investing is in the entity, not you as an individual. So normally when your first investor comes on, so you can hold up until the first person says, I'm going to write you a check, then go out and do your uh, Delaware, swipe a card, $400, you're a corporation. They'll send it to you in the morning. Yeah, go ahead. So this group, the, the, this group that we're gathered here is Idea to IPO, which is a great name. And, but most companies uh, do get acquired. So it is, do, do companies who get acquired target it for the IPO and couldn't really make it so that they get acquired? Or do they actually target to be acquired and set up the company and the value proposition in that way? That's a great question. The optimist, oh, sorry, the, the question was, do most companies start off with the idea of becoming IPO, then change their mind, or how do they set up, and what's their, what's their end game? And that's a good question. I would argue that since most of them are going to get acquired as a, just as a, you know, why, why fight for the, why push a 5% rock up the hill when you can push a 95%? So I would say go for, plan for the acquisition. If that doesn't happen, you can always extend it to an IPO. But if you plan to do a long game and then start struggling part way, it could be difficult to change it. You know, um, now the reality is you can make these, change these minds at any given time. But my idea is to always go for the, you know, go for that 95% and if you find out you are with a 5%, you can shift at that point in time. Yeah. So in your uh, model, you say that you can get angel funding once you have uh, an MVP and collect and a strategy. How easy is that? Is that really the case for all startups? You know, if you have sort of software, something often, what I've heard is that often it takes, you have to actually have some users and customers and so on even before you can get angel funding. Well, that depends. Um, when I was in my first startup in late 1900s, <laughs> in, uh, so I was in my first startup at the beginning of the dot-com in 1999. Um, I'm going to tell you a quick story. So there's a reason that the dot-com bubble burst. So we were a startup. We built our MVP. We had no customers. We had some early adopters. We were all going after big corporate because everything was B2B in the dot-com, big corporate 500. We, were all, we all met each other in every single Fortune 500 lobby again. There's only 500 of them. We ran into them. Okay. So we went in there. That was our idea. We had no customers. We had a good MVP. We ran for about nine months. We went in and uh, pitched a few times. And actually, on the fourth time we pitched, it was actually the only the first time I was there. I wasn't pitching. I was just the business guy smiling and waving in the background. But the first meeting I went as employee 13, we got funded. And that would have been kind of this angel funding right here. Our first, did anybody want to get a guess what our first round of funding was? 25 million. Most of you were asking for 500K, right? <laughs> anyway, there's a reason the dot-com failed. <clears throat> anyway, but that was a great angel funding round now. It was different. The world was different there. So the bar has been raised since then. They expect more. Everybody expects more. Like anything, it's a more sophisticated environment. However, some angels even want you to have revenue. And when I hear that, I say, well, if I've got revenue, I don't need you. I'll just go straight to the VC. I've got revenue. I've got numbers. I can, do, I can give them what they want, or at least understand what they want. So if you, can, if you can communicate it, if you can do these things, for most investors, you'll have what you need. You have to have a team. You can't be an army of one. You have to demonstrate that you can do what you're trying to sell that you can do, however you want to do that. But in fundamental, this is, this is the squishy part up here. Because it's a gut feeling. Nobody really has one plus one equals two. Everybody's kind of winging it a little bit. Nothing's really black and white. There's nothing but really gray. When you get up here, 
it's really actually pretty easy to get funded in the VC world. Way easier than it is in the startup, in the, in the angel world, because VCs have a formula. If you make this, do this, and one plus one equals three, there's your check, done. It, they have a math formula. They have a fund. That fund is specifically defined on what it can fund, what it's looking for, what it's doing. And you've got revenue, they've like got those, so they can do the actual math and say, yeah, you meet our model, you're in, here's your check. Angels, it's squishy. They like you today, didn't like you tomorrow, whatever. It's a, it's a little different environment. Any other questions on the fundamentals? Okay. Now, oh, go ahead. At the moment, like after the downturn, what's the range of sort of check sizes uh, commonly for a seed investor? They're the same as before the downturn. Mm -hmm. The same as before. The, the, the actual, oh, sorry about that. What is the, oh, sorry about that. What is the, um, the question was, what, with the downturn, what are the, what is the, what's the check sizes now that the downturn's coming? Um, and the reality, it won't change the check sizes because um, it takes X amount of check to be, part, to be in it all. Angel investors, investors traditionally invest between 5K and 100K with big chunks around 25K. That's, you know, so like a lot of times, you know, so 25K might be a minimum investment you want to put in your note, you know, if you want to minimize getting $155,000 checks. Um, so anyway, but they, the check sizes won't change. What you'll see probably, the real question is what's the investor's going to do? On the invest angel side, they'll probably get nervous a little bit and do a few things because they've got money in stocks because they're angel investors, so they have money all over the place. So a lot of them may slow down and get their money back as the stock market's doing whatever it's doing and where they have their money that's going to lose money. So there may be that going on, and then they'll get back into it. VCs may slow down because they've funded a lot of company over the last 12 or 18 months that now may in fact have a very long winter coming ahead of them if they're in certain markets. So they have to watch out to not have zombie companies that are just trying to survive for two years while their market's down and come back. Um, but in general, once it stabilizes, the angel funding tends to stabilize a little bit sooner than the VC funding. But then if this one could be totally different and I could be completely wrong. My crystal ball only works occasionally. And sometimes not even that well. Okay, so let's talk about this. One of the reasons I got into this industry and doing some of the stuff that I'm doing and working with startups is because when I first started looking at things in the valley, and startups, you would swear that the only thing you have to do to get funded is have a good pitch deck. If you've got a really good pitch deck, you're in. If you've got a pitch deck, get picked up by an incubator, oh, you're done, life's good, you're funded, you're gonna be the next Google. Um, and the reality is it's not about the pitch deck at all. The pitch deck is purely the mechanism for you to communicate what you have to have done already. And that is have a great scalable business. If, if you don't have that, then you're not gonna have a good pitch deck. So what does happen, though, is I have seen professional pitch deck that have done by people that are just absolutely amazing. They tend to generally be marketing people. And then we sit down with our first due diligence and find out there's no meat behind the, you know, there's nothing there. They really don't have that sustainable business. They've got to, so that's the first thing. So before you start working on your deck, go through that first preparation phase. Understand what the, what's going on, do all your homework then do your deck. If you've done your homework and you have a good scalable business, then the deck should write itself. If you're building your business through your deck, which is not an uncommon process in the entrepreneur world, then that, that you're doing it wrong from the beginning. So keep in mind, at the end of the day, you're selling a business, not, not a pitch deck. Now, that's kind of the, just some fundamental high level stuff on the startup model, speed to market, it's not about the pitch deck, understand what you're doing, those kind of things. So any questions on that? Now we're going to talk a little bit about pitching and pitch decks itself. The art and science of getting funded. No questions? All right, let's go. So we talked about this earlier today. Here's the chart I was talking about. These came from DocuSign. They do the stats. Um, I believe that's the word. And uh, these were from 2019 but they really don't change from year to year. And these are also for the Silicon Valley, so if you're from Switzerland, your, your mileage may vary. But in general, you're gonna contact 58 investors, meet with 40 of them. In 2019, the average raise was 1.3 million. That's how much they got funded on average, okay? 
and it took 12 and a half weeks to close once they got to their first investor. So when I have companies that want to work with us and say, hey, I'm looking for some funding. Oh, great, great. What do you, what's your schedule? Oh, we'd like to get funded you know, by you know, maybe the end of September, early October. Fantastic. Do you have a lead investor? And they says, no, not yet. Yeah, that's probably not going to happen by October. <laughs> so anyway, so now let's talk about the pitch deck. Let's do some uh, urban myth. Oh, sorry about that question. Didn't see you. Could you define the term uh, lead investor? The first one. The first one that starts it all and negotiates the, all the terms. You, so you should show up with a term sheet that says this is what we want to do. Then when you're done, the invest, lead investor will tell you what they want to do. And if you like it, then they're the lead investor. <laughs> you know, and so they set the stage for everything after that. And the second question was um, the $1.3 million, how many investors does that uh, represent? Well, from a, if I'm the CEO of the startup, I'd like it to represent one. But it'll represent however many it takes to get 1.3 million. That's why we're talking earlier. You might want to, if, if you're raising funding in your note, you want to say, let them know we're looking for a minimum 25k investment, or whatever. Um, and then the reality is that note, you may, that note may be open for a year. You just want to keep getting the money to pay the bills every month. And I mean, and you know, and you may not actually get your last check until the last 30 days when you're trying to get that last check to pay the last bill. So anyway, so it's going to come through milestones, but that's normally how that works. Yep. Okay, now let's talk about, oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you mentioned about the convertible note. Huh? Do you prefer convertible note or safe? Ah, well, that's a good question. So for South Valley Angels, oh, what's the question? Convertible note or safe note? So for South Valley Angels, we're only doing a safe note because we only intend on getting a couple angel rounds, which will take us to profitability, and then we really aren't looking to go out and raise a VC round because we want to stay very friendly with the angels and we should be able to make enough money to scroll without having to do that with $10 million worth of funding to blow up marketing. So the safe note is for preferred by a lot. The downside to a safe note is based off of a date. Uh, it has no date. So an investor, I don't know when that note comes to an end. It could go on forever and, and never go. It's based on somebody says, okay, I'm ready to do your next round. Boom, I got to do a pay. Now my safe note's over. We all go over and do our thing. A convertible note really came out of the banking industry, so it's like a loan or a lease. It's, it's by a month. It's a date. Now, the problem with, a de with that is there's a date. So if you get to the end of that note and you're not quite done yet, which, in my opinion of an investor, if you got to, Mar to May 28th and you accomplished everything you're gonna, you said you are going to do a year ago, then I would say that you didn't push the envelope hard enough because you're in a cost plus environment. You don't know what you don't know yet. You're going to be building the product and you want it to be as good as much as you want. So if you actually finished 100% on budget on the end of the day, you probably didn't push very hard. Now, it's nice from the fact that you did, but here we are, South Valley Angels. We funded uh, Scale Upstream to launch their production unit. Um, and I was the CEO. I still am the CEO, not was, but I still am the CEO. But anyway, so I'm the CEO, and we were, we, had, we were funded in our first note to finish on May 28th. We actually, during that process of that year of working, we identified some features and some things we wanted to include in our version one, our production one, that we felt would be really critical for the success in early days, and we felt they were very important. So then we went back to South Valley Angels and said, hey, we got some new stuff. We really want to do some things. What do you guys think about this? This will make it better. That's going to cost an extra 100K. <laughs> And so they funded another note for 100K, which will now take us to truly what we think is a five-star production one. Um, we tried to, we wanted to get aggressive. We got aggressive. We wanted to do the most we could, the best we could in the shortest amount of time. And we kind of ran out of a little bit of money. But of course, we did what we wanted to do. So South Valley Angels is no problem. They wrote us another note. Boom. We did that. And that actually now moved that May to September. But the product is far better than it would have been. So again, that's the early stages. Nobody knows exactly what we don't know yet. You know, so it moves a lot. So that's the difference. Do you have a fate, you know? Do you drop off at the end of the date where now the date's over, and you you owe me money, you, you owe me money back and interest. I've never seen that happen. I've never got my money back. It was a, it was really a real disappointing conversation at that point. But anyway, <clears throat> anyway, that's the way the life works. Okay, now let's talk about pitch decks. Back to that urban question. How many pages should your pitch deck be? Number. Who's got a number? Ten. Ten. There you go. Anybody else have another number? It takes more than five for wasting my time. Oh, okay. I like that. That's a good call. Now, the, the industry, if you go with forever, the industry standard in this model has been ten. And I believe I have a hypothesis why that is. Because there's two industry standards, Guy Kawasaki and Sequoia Capital. 
So did the Silicon Valley version and the legal version. Guess what? They both have 10 bullets on their format. And so I've come to the conclusion that because those have been around so long, it has to be 10 pages. Both Guy Kawasaki and Sequoia Capital say they have to be 10 pages. Okay, so we're looking at the numbers that went out and talked to all these investors and got funded, right? Average pitch deck size was 19.2 pages, just for numbers. Now, that doesn't mean make a 19.2 page. The point is, back to what was mentioned there, is to do it in a manner that's clear, concise, and compelling. Just do that. Now. How many, of you are work, how many of you are working on pitch decks right now? Anybody? Okay, got a couple of you. Okay, well those of you that haven't done it, it's an amazingly exciting experience on Rev 42 and 350 hours later of trying to do the perfect pitch deck. Now, after you've done all that, the average investor is going to spend three minutes and 44 seconds looking at your deck that you just spent 500 hours in 32, 42, 52 revisions and you've been living with it for months. So they don't spend much time. So all you smart business people and engineers out there, what's the next question you should be asking me? That's right. What did they spend that three minutes and 44 seconds looking at? Because you better get that part right. The rest of it you can get wrong because they're not going to spend any time looking at it. So here's one that bring up one of the ideas. So I believe, we were talking earlier with some of the groups. I believe the, the current pitch process in the world of, of uh, startups is broken. It is so old and it has gotten so out of skew that it just kills me when, when, when investors come, when, when uh, startups come and pitch. Okay? So what's the number one thing you're supposed to be doing? Everybody's supposed to be solving a problem, right? You've got to be solving a problem. I will tell you right now, you can make more money solving a desire than you can solving any money. If people desire it, they will buy it, whether there's value or rationale or, you know, why did that guy buy that brand new Porsche when he was 62? Because he's always wanted a brand new Porsche, and now he can afford one, and he's going to rationalize why he's doing that. Now, yes, you need to be solving a problem, but that's not the focus. This, the problem you're solving is a result of a different analysis. So, what did those investors look at in that three minutes? Guess what was the least important thing that they looked at? What do you think it was? Your solution. They didn't look at it at all. They spent 10 seconds looking at your solution. They didn't really care. Why is that? Because they looked at your solution. They go, yeah, it fits this box. It fits in the sandbox. Yeah, I can see how that could work. Fair enough. They're going to take you at face value in the first meeting that it does what you say it's going to do. That is, they don't really care there. The most important thing is do the numbers work? This is a financial activity here. Angel investors aren't doing, investors aren't doing it for the fun. They're here to make money. Now they may be an impact investor and maybe changing the world at the end of the day is more important to them, but at the end of the day they're here to make money, preferably lots of it and so forth, okay? They spend almost no time. If the numbers don't work, then nothing else is relevant. The numbers just don't work, okay? So now let's fill the gaps in. Oh, by the way, the second thing they didn't care about was the problem. They're, they're given, they, they, you know, they can look at that and say, yeah, close enough for this meeting, this works. Now, later meetings, we're gonna bring people that understand your space, they've probably used all of your competitors, they know them intimately. Then they'll come in and spend time talking about the problem and solution and come back and tell us whether you have a good solution to the problem. So. If your numbers work, it appears you have a team that can do it, you fit in the competitive landscape, and you answer the why now question, that is the core to getting funded. We said earlier, 42% of startups fail because of timing. They didn't answer the why now. So we'll talk in a few minutes here about a little different format to work out. Any questions on that? Anybody disappointed that your baby isn't higher on the list? <laughs> Go ahead. When you're talking, it sounds almost like you're using the pitch deck in two different ways. One is that you email it to somebody and you hope they need it, and the other is you're actually using it in front of them. So yeah. Because obviously then you're controlling like, the time of the So I mean, should you have You're always controlling it. You sent them the, first, the pitch deck to begin with, probably your first mistake. Oh, sorry about that. So he's talking about um, sending a pitch deck versus presenting a pitch deck, okay? So I would recommend never sending a pitch deck to an investor. 
Surprisingly enough, the more information you give somebody, the more reasons you give them to say no. All you want to do is compel them. You're, all you're trying to do at any mo moment is either get to the first meeting or get to the next meeting. And you don't get to the next meeting by answering all the questions. You get to the next meeting by leaving them hanging. <laughs> and saying, well, I don't have time. Look at that time. I've only got two more minutes to pitch. I know this is going to take me a couple hours. How about, about one tomorrow? Bring your tech team with you, and we'll come and sit down. So it's always about get to the next meeting, get to the next meeting, get to the next Oh, there's the hands on that one. Yeah, go ahead. Oh. OK, I'm going to give you a selfless uh, plug here. Go to scaleupstream.com, <laughs> sign up, build your, build your startup page, and click the button that says, ask to pitch. And you'll be on their list, you'll be di directly connected with them digitally, and you guys can message all day. No barriers. A little selfish, selfish plug there. But it is going to change the world, trust me. All right. Okay. <coughs> yeah, go ahead. So you said that the number one is financials and the numbers yep. work, but this is all hypothetical, right? They're talking about the future. Oh. They're talking about, you know, this is their strategy, and they have this hockey stick. Um, you know, sales forecast. So, how valuable is that? So, what sort of numbers are you talking about? Well, I'd say your forecast and revenue is probably useless. Mm -hmm. We can might all agree that says, yeah, that's pretty good. You know, I've never seen a company go to 200 million in three years, but you could be a first. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but anyway, what's not though in question, and shouldn't be, you should be no more than 10% off your expenses. You should know exactly what it costs. I can get a quote for anything. If I want to do an assumption on, a, on a, an office building in Menlo Park, I can call a few readers, hey, yeah, it's going to cost you $3,500 a month for a 900 square foot office building. Expect it to go up 10% a month. Perfect. Boom. There's my assumption. I'm starting at this price in Menlo Park and blah, 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 blah. Your expenses should be accurate. Your revenue, we can sit over a glass of wine or a beer and, and talk about revenue all day and think, wow, that'd be awesome, wouldn't it? But your cost, if you have the wrong costs, you have the wrong ask. That's what you're talking about. Ah, so in my opinion as an investor, eh, revenues are nice. You're going to tell us it's going to be $400 million in three years, and it's going to be amazing at 98% profit margin. It's no risk, guaranteed. Okay. But the reality is it's the cost. Because your cost is wrong, then everything's all hosed up. Yeah. You hire a nice CFO person that does know exactly what cost you're going to incur, pay them $1,000, sit down and build your five-year, by-month cost model. Done. And you'll learn how to do it in that process. Oh, all right. Sorry about it. Cost model. How do, we, uh, how do we project a cost model? I can't read you. You're in the glare there. OK. Yeah, yeah. I'm supposed to repeat the questions. OK. Sorry about that. Yes. Um, you're right, but, but it can be done. In fact, the cost is the easiest. It's all, it, you can lay it all out and get quotes. But I would recommend, I'm going to give you another soapbox of mine. <clears throat> and I'm going to use Scale Upstream as an example. Scale Upstream is accessible to anybody in the world, and it has a free section in it. You can come up and do amazing things at zero cost. However, as a business, the longer you stay in free, the more likely you are to fail. At some point in time, you have to start spending money to make money. And so that's where it becomes important. Instead of paying somebody who's going to generate an investor list for you that you're going to then start chasing down to find out none of them actually fit, but you just paid $5,000 for that investor list, what you should do is pay $500 or $1,000 to somebody who can help you do a strategic plan, help you lay out some finances, help you understand how to start your business, pay for services to move the needle. It's about moving the needle. So, so anyway, a lot of startups will just stay free forever and say, hey, for $500, these guys can do this. But no, that startup will spend a year trying to do it. And then I'll meet them a year later and say, you know about that thing you talked about last year? Can I still do that? <laughs> you know, so it's about speed to market. The longer you're not moving forward, the, 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 the more trouble you're getting into. So it's where you spend the money. Not the buying lists and stuff aren't a great way to do things, but it should, you should always try it as a startup. You don't have much, so spend it where it moves the needle. Yeah. Because I'm really I'm curious. So one of the key uh, one of the key things in which startups want to spend, I mean, once they get funding, is on people, right? So is that okay? They well, who? They want to hire, okay. Want to hire a, you know business development person or not? Yeah, that's always first because they always have the tech and the CEO. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you a myth that has been developed out of the startup model that is much like it, it, in my opinion it's in the same bucket as the. 10-page 10, 10 pitch deck, is that 
Investor, investors don't like, like, like to pay for salaries. Well, if nobody's getting paid, you probably aren't going to keep that team very long. You're probably never going to finish what you're doing. At some point in time, people have to get paid. In a startup, 90% of your costs are going to be labor because you've got four people doing all the work. And so those four people are going to have some sort of a salary. Now, what investors don't want to see is those salaries don't buy TVs, vacations, colleges, cars. They pay the bills. So in this valley, if you, you should be below $7,500 a month as a, as a management team in this valley, and an investor will be fine with that. But you start getting over that. They like five. But if you start getting over 7,500, then they're going to question, are you buying something else with my money besides the business? But you always have to have it. Now, everybody likes to say, oh, we're going to bootstrap it. Well, it's great if you exited PayPal and you've got money in the bank and you can bootstrap for a year and pay a $3,000 a month house and car and insurance and everything else that goes along with that. So it's kind of a fallacy. The investors know that without people, the company can't operate. But they want to make sure that the salaries and stuff that's being paid to the people is within a reason. And you know, everybody knows, again, we're back to that. If I'm, the longer you stay in free, the least li less likely you're going to succeed. And that includes your employees. At some point in time, they're all going to say, hey, I, I can't do this anymore. They're going to go back and get a day job or whatever the case. So salaries will be the biggest chunk. It, it just will be. You just won't call them salaries. You'll call it business development, product development, and operations. <laughs> OK, any other questions? Yeah. How do you protect your business model and IP? Um, how do you protect your business model and IP? See, I'm, I'm learning. OK. Um, well, that's a good question. The, the stock answer is you, you get, a, you get a, a patent, right? And then somebody copies it anyway. Now what do you do? OK, so that's the legal standard answer. Um, but I'd say there's a couple things. One, you shouldn't talk about IP. Um, if it's easy enough for somebody to copy, then it might not have much barrier to entry. We get startups that say, hey, man, we developed this in six months. OK, well, that means not, not, I don't know how good your team is, but probably anybody can do it in six months then. OK, so there's, a, some, there's various things to do it. The reality is, and we'll talk about the vision in the center, probably nobody has the exact same vision you do of how you see the future. And that starts differentiating it right, right there. So if you, re, if you remove the vision, visionary of the company out, the company will probably flounder or they'll lose the critical path. Um, you know, if they've been going long enough, you can do that. OK. And so we're going to get close to some of these. Oh, what's going on here? There it goes. Ish. OK. Before we start with this, I'm going to give you the highest level thing. So does, before we get even too far, does anybody know what, what the most, um, three most important problems you need to solve to get funded? Every one of you. They're not different for anybody. They're the same for everybody in here. And if you can solve these three problems, I guarantee getting funding, assuming what you're doing is legal. And maybe some people aren't even so critical about the legal piece. But anyway, but assuming it's legal, what are the three problems you have to solve? And what's a shot in dark? Go for it. How are you going to get your customers? Oh, uh, you're tactical, huh? OK. Maybe technical side? No, no, I'm even making simpler than that. This is your, this is your 30 second elevator pitch. Product market fit. Ah, oh, so you guys are thinking it too hard. As an investor, how to make the most amount of money in the least amount of time at the lowest risk. If that's you, I'll write you a check. I don't care what you're doing if it's legal. If you're going to give me the most amount of money in the least amount of time and the lowest risk, that's what I want to know. If that's you, you're in. There you go. That's all an investor wants to do. If you can do that and you're the one, you'll get the check. Now, how do you communicate that? That gets complicated. So let's start by this. How you see yourself. Well, obviously, you're the best product out there. You're the best value, best price. We have the most benefits. We're awesome. You can make your check out too, OK? Is that good? And you have to see you're that. You have to know that you're building a competitive product. You have to believe it. You have to, I mean, you have to be. It, you, know, you have to be 10 times better than what's out there today, period. Well, that's the tribal standard, OK? So you just have to be 10 times better. And I hope that's how all of you see you. However, the bad news is that's not how we see you as an investor. We don't see you as that at all. 
Why? Because all of you in our lobby have the best value, best product. You're competitive. Like you're the, you have all the yeses or all the X's and the competitors don't. So the, what's, the, what's the point? Again, we're looking for an opportunity. We invest in opportunities. And like we said earlier, what defines an opportunity? The numbers work. The team looks like they can do it. It looks like the timing's right. You know, these are, the, these are what start identifying the opportunity. Everybody in our lobby is the best thing, best product, and so forth. Again, what's the opportunity? The opportunity is the most amount of money in the least amount of time with the lowest risk. That's, that's always our opportunity. <laughs> now, again, if we can change the world and at the end of the day, that's a bonus. So that's, that's the difference. We see you as an opportunity, not a product. So you are never selling the investor your product. You're just going to say, hey, here's our product. It's 10 times better today. We can come back and beat down the details with somebody who knows what we're talking about. Yeah? Given how much uncertainty there is, given how much uncertainty there is in early stage companies, particularly like pre-product market fit, I'd sort of argue against the idea that you can somehow rank them. I mean, isn't it more binary? Either the team looks good enough, the opportunity looks good enough, you know, and then you go for it or you don't. Like the idea that you can sort of really look at 10 companies and say, oh, I think this is number two and this is number four. And, uh, All right. Unlike go out to scale upstream and we'll show you how that happens. Every investor, every investor has a ranking that they believe in. Is it right? They seem to think it is. Um, but, but anyway, every investor, what makes a good wine? How did a wine become a 92? Oh, he had a microphone. So you're just teasing me now. You're just teasing me. Oh, he just, yeah. So you psyched me out. You had a microphone. I thought everybody could hear it. So I was thinking, oh, man, I just, I, okay. Did you, did you get it? Sorry about that. Okay, I'll, I'll repeat again. I won't, I won't fall for the microphone ploy. No, the microphone's okay. Is it okay? Okay. All right. So anyway, um, so anyway, it's about an opportunity. You're always selling the opportunity, not the product. So now, let's talk about some of the things. I'm going to put the tribal standards. We talked about that already once. One, you have to be 10 times better than what's out there. Well, then what's out there. And we're going to talk about the problem here in a minute, too. So when it comes to the problem, 99% of all startups we talk to, they talk about the tactical problems of today. The problem that, the problem that today's customer has, that you're, they're going to solve for them. Everybody in your market space is solving the same customer problems because they're the logical customer problems to, be, problems to be solving in that marketplace. So all you have to tell us is we're 10 times better and give us a, good, a little reason why, you know, compel us a little bit to say, oh, okay. Now, on an advantage for most of you right now, most of you are going to incorporate some sort of machine language or some sort of AI or something into your platform or what you're doing if you're a software company. So almost inherently, you're going to be 10 times better than analog, right? just by default if you did any, even close to doing it right. Okay, so on a positive note, most of you should be able to get to 10 times better. It was just like it was when the Steve Jobs and all those guys came up back in the late 80s and early 90s. They were in the computer industry. If you were in the computer industry and you do it right, you were probably going to be successful. We didn't know what that was going to look like yet, but now we do. Oh. Okay, number two. You're 10 times better, and your numbers that we said, the financials, show that you can believably get to 100 million. Now we get into the discussion is how do we all believe that and so forth. Again, these are what I call tribal standards. They're kind of what investors still look for. Hey, you're 10 times better, and can you get to 100 million? So keep that in the back of your mind. Now. I'm going to steal from how to talk like a CEO. So this is one of the slides that I'm out of tomorrow's class at 9 a.m. if you want to learn about talking like a CEO. And we're going to steal a little bit like this because surprisingly enough, this can almost be as critical in anything else you're doing. If you present incorrectly, don't appear to be the right CEO, we've had a lot of startups pitch to us that said, you know, I really like the idea, but I'm not sure that's the right leadership to really lead that company. I'm not sure that people would join that team. I, I, I mean, great idea, love what they're doing, but I'm not sure that's them. Um, and that's, there's nothing you can do about that. It's, it's just the way the game, the game goes. So as a CEO, there's a couple key things we talk about. Um, 
Oh, I keep forgetting. I have to go back here. Whoa, that's interesting. Well, there's your startup message. How come we're all messed up here? Oh, let's see here. Now it's not clicking at all. Hold on here. Um, huh. There should be a bunch of stuff above that. Not sure where it's at. It was there this morning. OK, anyway. There's, anyway, so um, let's talk about talking like a CEO. <laughs> the bullets you're not seeing is, number one, we're talking about speaking strategically, not tactical. It's strategic, the high level. And that's why so many people get caught up in pitches of getting, running out of time, is you're talking about it on a tactical level because you're tactically there. You're, you're, you're going through this. So it's important to talk to strategic. If you took a look at two Fortune 500 CEOs, they'll get together for lunch, 30-minute lunch. They'll talk about business for 10 minutes, and they're done. And in that deal, they closed a $500 billion merger. Well, guess what? The rest of the company is going to spend the next 10 years to make that $500 billion merger happen. But the meeting, the pitch, was no more than 10 minutes. They shook hands. They got it. We're on the same page. We know where we're going. Let's go have our, your people can talk to my people. We'll make it happen. So it's about being strategic. And so it also is talking about the things. Another thing is talking about what we call the baby. Everybody likes to talk about the baby or the product. And that makes sense because you're down in the weeds working on that on a day-to-day living with it and fixing everything. So your brain is in the day-to-day -day pieces of that. So that's where you think, OK? Now, the reality is most investors don't care about the baby. All babies are cute, more or less. Um, but the baby is one thing. We, want, we don't really want to talk about the baby. We want to talk about the diapers and the feeding, because that's where all the problems happen. The baby itself is cute and looks like a baby and does what baby does, but it's those other things. So it's more about the strategic and the big picture. You sell your, you sell your product to customers. You sell your business case to investors. We don't buy your product. Your product is simply one notch on the bullet to determine whether you're going to get to the next meeting. We don't need to understand it in detail. Um, so that was the fundamentals that I had on that slide. It's weird. I wonder if there's like white font or something that happened in the process. Oh, a technology. You can only trust it most of the time. I don't know what happened. OK. So now we were talking common pitch decks. Here's your industry standards. Guy Kawasaki and Sequoia, and Sequoia Capital. Oh, there's those 10 bullets. They both said 10, so it must mean 10 pitch deck, 10 page pitch deck. Now, as an investor, we really don't care what order they're in. What we want is to understand what you're doing and for it to be compelling. Now, I would like to introduce the new way to present your idea. Maybe not. I'll just keep you hanging in suspense a little longer. OK, alternate format. When you're talking to an investor, what's most important to the investor is the, your road likes, looks like that and not like this. You have a clarity. This is why the Steve Jobs and these folks got funded back in the day. They didn't have a Mac when they got funded. They had technology and boards and stuff and playing a little bit of Lisa, which was going to be at some point in time someday down the road, but it wasn't any of that stuff. However, they knew exactly what that road looked like. They knew exactly what that light at that end looked like, and they had a clarity of what they needed to do and how to get there. That's why they got funded. Then they built a team around it to make that happen. OK, so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about an alternative format where you start with a, a vision. We believe the future of, or we see a future where, is this. The future of the automobile will be electric. Because of that, we see a $482 trillion opportunity in the electric vehicle market. The trends that are driving that today is regulations. Almost every country in the world has to have electric vehicles on the road, no gas by, night, by 2030. There's regulation coming. The market's coming. This is coming. You're, you're, it's not stopping. The electric vehicle's coming. And that's why now. So what vertical markets are we going after? Well, our solution is we're making two things, batteries and charging stations. Why? Because every vehicle has to have a battery. 
And everyone has to have a charging station. So that is our opportunity. What's the problem we have to solve? Well, to capture the, the battery market, we have to build a better battery. The industry is not looking for lighter batteries, smaller batteries. They want 1,000 miles on a charge, and that's not going to be cheap for a while. So if I can't build a better battery, I cannot possibly capture the opportunity. However, on the charging market, charging station market, I do not have to build the best charging station if I can put one in every garage and on every corner. So those are two, that's how we're solving those two pictures. We're building a bit. So that walks me through. What's our product? It's, I just told you it's what it is, and that's why we're doing it. How's the competition? We believe the market is going to be moving this way in the battery industry and this way in the charging industry, and that's why we're doing what we're doing. And we believe if you're going any other direction than that, you're wrong. Now here's our plan to do that. Here's stage one. Here's angel funding. Here's VC funding. Here's business development, product development, and operations. And here's our funding strategy. Here's our team that's going to execute that plan. Here's our numbers that say we're making 91% margin and $400 million in 18 months. And here's our funding slide. We need 500K to execute our 18 months plan. You can make your check out too. So that's a better, that's not starting up here. I'm saying I'm solving a problem. I see a, I, I see a vision in the future. I know what the future looks like, and this is what we believe. Does anybody here not believe it's going electric? Oh, I think it's going to go hydrogen. Ooh, okay, maybe we want to talk a little bit about that. So anyway, think about your vision. That's really what you're selling is your vision because none of your products, you're not selling today, you're selling a future product. You're selling the product that we're going to fund you to finish and have ready to go out and blow up in the market in 24 months, maybe three years. Fair enough? So what if we, you know, what if, the pro well, what if we didn't see the future and we missed it? What if we ended up being beta and in three years, everybody, or Sony, everybody ran out the door in three years and I've got my beta tapes, the entire world went VCR. Oh my gosh, how did that happen? I'm Sony, I couldn't possibly have missed that. Okay? Anyway, there's... Things like that where big companies go the wrong way on the, on the market. And that's where that timing is. That's, that's that piece that kills you. So look at that. That sounds a lot better, and there's a lot of ways to work through that. Okay. Any questions on that? Yeah, go ahead. So I graduated from Founder Institute, and this was the first uh, type of deck they recommended for mm -hmm. the idea stage. But when we were a little bit like, further into it with, with more numbers and and metrics to give. Yep. I think the other ones were recommended. So. Well, that's because you have metrics to give. You're, now you're talking to VCs and they don't care about visions, then you make them money. Okay. You know, there's they're distinct visions. But if you didn't start with the future, then I'd almost guarantee those metrics you get aren't going to be the right metrics that you want that a VC is going to be interested in because you may have not gone the right direction. So you've got to start somewhere. And just by starting with a head in the sand saying, I'm going to solve a problem, pick it up and say, hey, here's my problem. I solved it. It's awesome. And that is what we get. Now. So let me ask you this. Who, who's, who's, who's out thinking about pitching or who's kind of in the stage where they're doing a deck or planning stuff out? Just anybody. Perfect. You're in hand first and you asked me a bunch of questions, so I got one for you. Give me your vision statement. Do you have a vision statement? I don't know what that means. Ah, there we go. Number one. How, so how do you see the future? Why, why, are, why is your idea relevant in three years? Which, what's the future? Oh no, are you building a product yet? Sorry? Are you, do you have a product you're trying to launch? Yeah. So. Okay, so if I was to ask you your vision, how do you see the future? Why are you relevant? Where, where's the future going? That, so first question, this is 99% of the time, this is the response I get. I, it's crickets. Okay, and that's because today's entrepreneurs aren't visionary. They're solving a, they're solving a problem. They're just solving a problem 99% of the time. Now, I'll, I'll take the pressure off here, off you a little bit. I won't make you go. So the second answer I get is usually, well, we're going to dominate the world. Well, that's not a vision statement either. It's a nice goal, you know. And uh, or I get a mission statement, but rarely do I get a vision statement where I believe the future of the, the future of agriculture is going to be to grow local and consume local. AI will replace humans in business workflow. These are vision statements say, okay, I can buy that. And because of that, here's how we see the opportunity. And this is why we're doing what we're doing. Does that make sense? Now I know what it is, I can tell you. Okay, go. Give me a vision statement. Okay, so um, uh, basically I want to build. Uh, oh, you start, oh, you're wrong already. I want to build. No, no, no. What, why do you want to build? Where's the future going that says you want to build? Just because you want to build it doesn't mean anybody wants it. All right. So getting to space has historically been very expensive. So oh, that's a problem. Yeah, that's a problem. The future of, finish that sentence. The future of what? 
uh, low Earth orbit manufacturing and research. You say low orbit? Low Earth orbit. Low or OK. The future of low Earth orbit will be what? Uh, launch costs are massively falling. Oh, those are, that's a no, no, no. The future of low, low Earth orbit will be, will be primarily driven by a commercial f fleet that moves logistics in and out of that more orbit to do this, that, and the other. And because of that, we're setting up a generational, next generation delivery platform that will be able to manage the logistics necessary to operate the for low orbit as it's, we see it going forward. Something like that. I have no idea what you're doing. I made that up on the fly. But if any of you are doing that, you can use it. Uh, but anyway, so understand where is, the, where is the direction of low orbit going and why is your product relevant? So you don't have to answer that right now, but, we, we, you, know, but you know what I'm saying? So that's the future. The future of low orbit is going to be based on highly efficient single shot commercial programs that are going to do this, this, and this. And because of that, we're developing this and we're going after this piece of that. And that's where we're going and there you go. So does that make sense? You know, your, your gear, I can see your gears turning. You're dying, to, you're dying to sit down and talk about this. Anyway, go ahead. No, so far, you seem to be uh, sort of saying that it's not talking about the problem and it's not talking about the context. So if it's, uh, what is it? So, so Where's the future going? The future of the automobile is electric. There are a million problems in the electric vehicle supply chain and the electric vehicle ecosystem that thousands and thousands of startups could solve. But if I don't believe that the future is in the electric vehicle, then I'm not going to fund any of them. Well, I don't care. But if we say the future is electric vehicle, and we go, ah, I'm on board. I actually agree with that. OK, we have a starting point. So that's where the vision is going. Are you headed in the right direction? Not do you have the right product? I would argue that nobody knows what the right product is. I feel like in a lot of cases, your investor is not going to have researched the area as much as you have, right? In general, Probably, I would guarantee that. I would almost guarantee that. Right, and therefore, I would argue that if you're going to try and tell the story, you need to provide some context. You know, if you're educating your investor, you're in the wrong house. Mm -hmm. If you're educating your investor on the market, you're in the wrong house. They, you're talking to the wrong investor. If I have to educate you to invest in my product, then I'm probably not going to invest because I don't know your product. So you, they should at least understand the functional aspect. But I'm going to give you an example. Um, um, oh, let's go to it. We're going to come up to this. I'll hit you something here real quick. And I'm going to show you. I've got an example for that. I think it's in this, this presentation. Let me, let me get there first. OK. So formulate your business case from your vision. This is where the future is going, and this is where we believe the business is going to happen. Oh, man, wrong direction. OK. Understand the opportunity and trends and the customer. Solve the right problems. And those are not necessarily the customer's problems. Have a plan, know what it's going to cost. We talked about that earlier. And back it up with numbers and facts. So this is the key on that, this piece here. Now, what I want to talk a little bit how is document an opportunity and talk about what we're doing on the vision and planning, OK? We're going to break this down and walk into what you're, where you were talking about, about solving the right problems and so forth. Oh, man. Wrong buttons. It works when I don't want it to. There we go. OK. Yeah. Question. So you, you don't think the business model is important? Well, absolutely it's important. That's, that comes out of the finances. When I'm looking at your financials, your business model is what drove those financials, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's absolutely important. In fact, it may be your differentiation. You may have a unique business model being applied to a market that's never used it, done that before. Yeah. Uber, Airbnb. Exactly. So you can be one of those. So yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I just don't refer to as business model. It's what drives the financials. Right. OK, where are we at? OK, again, you're selling the future. And we talked about this. Your TAM, SAM, SOM. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Did you just quickly go back to the previous slide? Yeah. Maybe. Oh. Let's see, was that with this one? Oh, no, that was the, this one. There we go. To me, this sounds like a CEO speaking that knows what they're talking about. Because real quickly, so what's the two jobs of a CEO while we're on this chart? So me know, no, CEOs only have two jobs. What, what are they? They never change. Hiring and Oh, hell no. No, they're not hiring anybody. They're only doing that because they have to. They're going to hire somebody to hire somebody. <laughs> strategy I like, but it's different. Go ahead. Yeah, focusing on the vision. Oh, vision, number one. If, the C, if you don't bring the vision to the table, then who is going to? 
you know and the vision is what gives you your critical path with no vision you'll wander all over the place you'll run out of money and then you'll be one of these ten uh, well, you know nine out of ten that failed very good what's the second thing they do yeah go ahead no, I'm sorry, it was a question. oh yeah go ahead um, Oh, absolutely. You're talking about being it's like social impact, environmental impacts. Absolutely. That's a big part of what things are doing. In fact, a lot of people are designing very fresh business models that return to the sole person, particularly like things like agriculture and things like that. You know, the farmers get screwed all the time. And so a lot of companies doing impacts to actually provide funding back to the farmers for every piece that gets done. Other ones that do also absolutely impacts the strong area. And there's impact specific investors that invest impact specific things. Yep. Now, the second thing on a CEO. Raising money. That's the second thing. I'll come back to you in a second. You're always raising money. Oh, were you going to answer the question? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't. Anyway, those are the only two things you do. You bring a vision and you raise money. And you hire everybody else to do it. Because probably you're not as good as they are doing what they do. <laughs> so those are the only things you either do. You're either doing it for, through investors or you're doing it through shareholders or whatever the case may be. All right, back through here. Okay, now. Where are that? Okay, Tam and Sam. A lot of times when I ask somebody to tell me about the opportunity, oh, it's a $58 billion market. Again, that's not an opportunity. That's a, a bullet on a slide. It says there's a big market, but it doesn't define an opportunity. The, the newspaper print industry is still a multi-billion dollar industry. Very few investors are investing in it. But it's still a large industry, so it didn't say, oh, it's a $48 billion industry. Yeah, but it's dying. It won't be. Okay. So what we want you to really do is when you think about an opportunity, think about it in three terms. One, what is the sandbox that you're in? So earlier we were talking electric vehicles. So define your market. Again, we're not even talking about a product yet. You're saying you're in a given market. And the reason you're saying that is because you've already started building your product in most cases. So rather than doing this homework to determine what product you should be building, you actually sat down and said, hey, I'm going to solve a problem and now you're building a product. Is that an untrue statement for those entrepreneurs in here? That's 99% of it the, the time. That's what it is. Uh, but anyway, so define. Why is the sandbox you're in even a good market? And this is the number where you'd put a define your market. We're in the $38 billion whatever market. Just define one line that says this is the size of it. Now define why it's market. Well, this, this market's growing at X percent. It's expected to grow by X by 2025, 2030, whatever the numbers are. So just to find, why are you even in, why is electric vehicle even a good market? We all understand why it is, and most of the time at this level, they're going to show growth. But it's a number that's important, okay? Now the next piece is defining your vision. Oh, I see a future where this is happening. Okay, why? Because of these trends, these demographics, these things are happening. This is what's going on in this marketplace, and this is why now. This is where you define your why now. This is what's happening. Here's why it's happening now. Has no bearing on anything. The market's going this way, whether you play in it or not. Fair enough? And then finally, Finally, what are your market segments? So why are you doing it? So using my example, we believe the future of the automobile is going to be electric. That puts this in the, this sandbox, the vehicle market. This is why it's going to be a big market, because here's all the metrics and trends and what's going on and regulations. And we chose batteries and charging stations because everybody has to have one. That sounds a lot better than market size of 48 billion. You've now demonstrated me that you actually understand the market. You know where the market's going. You know where you fit in the market. You know why you arrived at where you did. You just didn't jump right at the end of the beginning of the day. Hey, we're making batteries. Okay. All right. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Again, this is a, a mindset to think about and incorporate into what you're doing. And this isn't necessarily just pitch deck. These are the ways you should think as a CEO. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Can't see you back there behind all this massive <laughs> camera equipment. Um, okay, so um, so what we're learning in our class is that primary and secondary um, uh, research is very important. Uh huh. Obviously, like to define your market and stuff like that. So, can you kind of like talk about which which one you used or how you use them in order to? Uh, to I'm going to give you another title. We're talking about oh. Oh, sorry, repeating the question. She's asking about primary and secondary market analysis we were talking about, right? And, and, and doing your detailed market analysis and what should you do and, you know, and, and how deep and so forth. So here's what I would say. 
Initially, you want to start up at a high level and do a top down just to get a sense of which way the arrow's pointed. And that's what we're talking about here. Now, I've worked in marketing. I've been a marketing person. I've been a business person. I've been an engineer. I've been a CEO. And me and the marketing people sometimes th see things a little different. You need to spend enough time. Think of, think of what you're doing as a chain. It's a connected chain. You cannot eliminate any of the links out of that chain or the process will fail. Fair enough? However, how deep you go into every one of those chains are different. Fair enough? Now, what you don't want to be is an engineer and have what we call analysis, a paralysis by analysis. You spend the time analyzing numbers, building a better product, better product, better product, and it's never ready. And eventually engineering says, okay, we've got to shoot the engineer because tomorrow we have to start selling something. We can't just keep making it better. So the question is, in the startup model, how can you understand your market as clear as possible without doing what the purest marketing people want you to do, which is spend three years and a gazillion hours to say, this is the perfect logo. Ford isn't famous because of their logo. They did a logo, and they're famous because they had a solid business. Now everybody recognizes the Ford logo. They didn't spend 100 hours running through groups to create a blue oval. When I did GLJ group, I go, man, what am I going to do? Gary Lee Jinx group. Ah, there you go, GLJ group, done, boom, I moved on. Um, now my arc, oh, how could you do that? Oh my God, that, it, it, you, you're going to fail without the right logo. Okay, so all those things are true. The more analysis you do, the better you'll understand it. But at some point in time, you hit a, a point of limited value return. Once you have a, co a corporation and you have marketing people and business development people that are looking at five-year trends and figuring out what you should be doing, then they can spend their whole life doing it eight hours a day because they're paid to do that. In the early stage, you have to balance speed to market with, with making educated decisions. Great question, though, because um, writing a plan is not progress. <laughs> just, just saying. Uh, analyzing a customer isn't progress. Getting that customer, that's progress. Just minor details of words. Pitches at 4 PM, OK. Cool, we're getting pretty close. OK, there we go. What are the market segments? OK, any questions there? This is only kind of a fire hose. We're just sort of giving you everything you'd want to know. Now, the problem and the solution. Notice I don't say the problem and your product. It's the problem and the solution. At this point, if you're thinking of, of this and we're talking about it, you've got problems, it's broke, and you've got solutions. The solution isn't necessarily you. If you're in the world of better, faster, cheaper, like 90% of the time is, the problem may be today it's 10. We believe that in the future to be viable, you have to be able to do it for one. If you cannot do it for one in the future, you will not be viable. Okay, fair enough. Now, what does that mean? So we can all agree with that. Okay, so you've got three main problems. You have a strategic problem. The strategic problem is capturing the opportunity. That is the number one problem you have to solve, capture the opportunity, okay? Going back to our battery example, to capture the opportunity in batteries, I just literally have to build a better battery today. If I can't build a better battery, I'm not going to play in the market. But if I can figure out how to put the charges on every station and so forth, I can win it. So again, what, do you have, what problem do you have to solve to capture the opportunity? Next are what we call tactical or today's problems. And this is where 99% of you entrepreneurs spend your time. You spend a list of 25 different problems you're solving for the customer. I, I don't know your market well enough to know if those are the right 25 problems to be solving. And I probably don't care. I'm going to bring somebody who knows you're in later to do it. So the real thing is that the longer you spend telling me the tactical problems, the more you're going to sound like every company that's in your space that walks in my office. Why? Because you're all solving the 10 customer problems because those are the logical problems to be solving today. But you're not solving today's problems. You're solving tomorrow's problems. So all you have to do in this area is say, hey, here's the main problems today. It's inefficient. And we're 10 times better. Good enough. OK, now it's not quite that simple, but don't spend a lot of time on your tactical. You really want to show us the strategic problems and the most important, the future problems. And the biggest future problem gets back to adoption. How are you going to get people to adopt what you're doing? If you're doing something truly futuristic, then people will not understand how to really use it. Fair enough? And so you're going to have to explain it. And we run through that on scale upstream. It's, it's, it's a different platform and a different method of doing things. You don't just go in there, upload your stuff, and then watch your email. 
we actually had to tell the startups when they first started coming out to scale the stream that actually to hit that button that says, ask to pitch. Because they just uploaded their documents and were waiting for somebody to reach out to them on email. So we said, ask to pitch. Oh my God, the next morning, everybody pitched. Okay, anyway, so metrics, stats, and quotes. Keep in mind, you, you're all better, faster, cheaper. You should be able to measure why that is. Not necessarily why your product's better, but what does the future have to achieve to be viable? Okay, now let's talk about your product, okay? Again, we don't need 10 pages on your product. You could give me four sentences, and I'm gonna give you an example on how you can do this. So a lot of times, if I ask somebody, what's your product? I get at least a five minute dissertation of what their product is. Okay, so we're, we're just gonna use the transportation as a form. So let's say I'm giving you my pitch, and I get back to the product. Okay, now we were talking about you know, the future of transportation and so forth. And now I'd like to tell you about our product. It's called a bicycle. I know many of you have heard of about a bicycle, but just for those that aren't sure, what, you know, so what does a bicycle do? It moves you from point A to point B. It's simple, simple transportation. How does it do it? It does it with human power. Why is that important? It will never require an outside energy source and will always be the most efficient form of transportation, period. Would any of you maybe be interested in learning more about that if you were an investor? Notice I didn't say anything about spokes, shifting gears, carbon fiber frames, derailers, handbrakes, because my, my audience may not understand. They know what a bicycle is, they've heard of it. Now next, if I get through this meeting because we've got the most efficient form of transportation, period, that's kind of a hook, they're going, ooh. Oh, okay, let me think about that. I might want to hear more about that. Guess what? I show up to the next meeting, and they've got a guy from Specialized sitting in there. Guess what? He knows bicycles. And they're going to spend hours talking about our bicycle and determine whether it's a better bicycle. Okay, fair enough. So that's how simple it should be. You've ever heard the say, Grandma should understand what you're saying. Again, I don't need all the details. You're not here to educate me. Any questions on that? Now, after you've said, well, here's our product, it's a bicycle, it runs on human power, and it's amazing, okay? The next big thing really becomes the important stuff. Why you? This gets back in, somebody asked about business, about um, your model, your business model. Why us? We have a unique business model. It's never been applied to the low orbit business, okay? But do you have IP? Do you have a business model? Maybe there's a unique way of how you do your algorithms or something specifically different on what you do. Maybe it's some of the people who you are. Maybe it's a partnership. We worked with a, a startup that um, had a product that they sold to stadiums, sports stadiums. And uh, <clears throat> what their partner was Budweiser. Why is that important? They sell beer in every stadium in the United States and most of the world. Well, maybe not so much in Germany and Europe where they have much better beer. But anyway, but that gets sold everywhere. So why was that an advantage? Because they could say, hey, what five stadiums do you want to go talk to today? Budweiser calls the sales reps and whoever's there and says, hey, I want you to meet with these five people. Boom. And next thing you got more, a meeting tomorrow. That's an unfair advantage. Okay, but these are the kind of things that become why you, not because this is better. Fair enough? Any questions? All right, we're getting four, 355, getting close. Question in the back. Was there a question? Yeah, just a quick question. Yeah. So when you just told us the alternative uh, format, format uh -huh. was why you in there? Why you? Yeah. Yeah, that falls under your opportunity. Okay. I mean, excuse me, not why you, but that's under your product. That, that kind of becomes the product and who you are. So there's, there's a solution, there's a product discussion. So the why you is kind of here, but they go together in the, in the discussion of you, your product, and so forth. They could be one or two pages. And uh, again, those are, those are categories. Those aren't page numbers. So when you get down to the product and the why you, that kind of goes together there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, or however you like to set it up in your presentation style. Okay, now, the competitive landscape. Now we're getting ready to wrap it up. So, your vision that you all are gonna develop is, gonna ha is, is how we, where this comes to rest. Your vision is how you see this landscape. There's nothing on here about business, about product. This is a business positioning insight. 
not we have the best product. So there's no X's, no, no no's, none of that kind of stuff. So what we want to do is everybody in here has three competitive segments. What I'd like you to think about your competitors isn't is my product better, I want you to think about it in the version of history. Because we're investing on are you going in the right direction. So I want to know today, you have three types of competitors. Everybody has three competitors. The first one is the incumbent. That's the company or the technology that's been doing it forever, 20 years. They're the, the Googles of the world or the Facebook if you're in social media. And in many cases, it's not even a brand anymore. There's so many people that do it, it's just a product. So for example, anybody in here thinking about doing any kind of like a business software to change up the business office environment? Okay, very popular area. What is the number one most used software in business today? Hmm? Outstanding. 30 years running, it's still friggin' Excel. Medium sized small businesses, they have the Excel spreadsheets from hell. They run their entire business off of a spreadsheet that whoever's running that spreadsheet, if they die, that business is done. Nobody knows what's in that spreadsheet. Okay, it is still the most popular. So for many of you, you don't have a brand, you have something like Excel, the industry standard, and that's what you're replacing. So, so the incumbent is whatever's been going around for 20 years, everybody knows what they are, and in most cases, they're a dinosaur doing it the old way, but it doesn't matter, they're a Fortune 500 company, and who cares? They're gonna do what they wanna do. Okay, next, you got the new kids on the block. What the new kids do? Well, they took what the incumbents were doing and probably turned it into a SaaS model. They probably moved it online, took a fractured, fragmented environment, moved it all around, all this, that, and the other. And now they did. Now they will have names. They will be the, in the Facebook example, Facebook is an incumbent, the Instagrams, the, you know, the TikToks, all those folks. But then you get to the ones you're most curious about, and that is the next generation like you, because they're the ones that are going to be coming out of the door in two to three years from now with the same kind of products that you do, and that is the one we're all betting on you to be able to survive when that happens. There you go. So how do we do this? We do it quickly and simply. So we're going to talk about this. As we told you in our vision statement, the future of X is going to be faster and create action. Okay? So if we take a look at the incumbents today, oh, if you take a look at the incumbents today, oh, man, this thing is just all over the map. Oh, okay, let me just get back to here. Um, so the idea is if you're doing the incumbents today, you can talk about them, and they're going to they're be the dinosaurs. They're almost always going to be down here because they just are the old school of doing it. Then you're going to click in there and say, the new kids on the block are the twos. They're moving into a faster realm, but they're not really following the four piece of what we feel is important. We only know of one company like us. So the idea that says, if, if you're not moving into here, oh, there we go. If you're not moving into there, you're wrong. Got it. Okay? So this is what we're doing here. So if you're not moving into there, you're wrong. And if you look at this and present it right, it will, there we go, it will walk it. The incumbents are old and slow. The new kids on the block are moving in this direction. We know of one next generation like us. They're primarily more going to action. But we believe that if you're not moving in this direction right here, you're wrong, period. You're going the wrong direction in the market. No discussion that my product's better. But I understand where the mark is going, and if you believe that we, if you understand our opportunity and agree in it, and you understand that we, under, the way we understand the market, that's 80% of the solution right there. You understand what you're doing, you know where you're going, and we're in agreement. All right, if you use this chart, use uh, navigation so you can do it. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this, I just wanted to throw here up your classic model. How do you make money? What's that look like? If you're early stage, you're not going to have CACs and LTV. Your first customer probably costs you $150,000 minimum. So your financial model is a key piece to that. All right, that's it. Question, go ahead. Um, can you explain uh, the information versus action on the graph? Sure. I just use that as an example. So if you take a look at the few, uh, of where things are going. In the first world, in my generation, when I started working, it produced paper, a piece of paper you put in your desk. Then the computer and everything came around and SAS models came out and now it actually generated data and information. I could actually look at that information and pull out of that 
a decision and do something. The future will do it for you. The AI will see the action, read, and take a look at, that, at what that is, and it'll make the decision, and it'll do the action. You won't even be around to do it because it doesn't need you anymore. So if your job in business automation is to review stuff and approve it, I hope your resume is updated and you're learning something new. So anyway, that's what I mean by that. That's where the future is going in, in that example. Yeah? Can you go back to the previous slide? The previous slide? Okay. I thought I had gone back. Sorry about that. There we go. You want to take a picture? Okay. Well, maybe if Rob's nice, he'll give you my email and maybe I could send it to you. It's not like you put it on the first slide or anything. But uh, if you guys want this, just send me an email at Gary at South Valley Angels. I'll, I'll send you the slides. All right, financial model, and that's it. The rest of it was a little bit of a, uh, we can talk about that later, but that's a little bit of some things for you. That's it. We're done. I'm mean, Rob's gonna make me do push-ups. I'm two minutes well, uh, late. Let's give it up for Gary for that great presentation. <laughs> All right. So uh, stay in your seats. We're gonna transition to doing uh, pitches. Oh, by the way, uh, this is gonna be posted to our YouTube channel, so it'll be available. And if you registered, uh, we can actually email you the slides. Is that okay? Absolutely. So uh, before we get get into the, I want you to queue up. Uh, we have. Kirfaz, and we have Saeed, who says they sent you their slides. Okay. That, uh, we have an announcement from Siva and Anitha, so let's hear it for Anitha. Applause. <laughs> hey. Well, first, thank you, uh, Gary. You always give helpful information. I actually went to you about three, four years ago yeah. when I first started in the idea, idea stage. So I wanted to give a heads up on a product that I've been working on for four years that would be very helpful when you're a startup because you need help with things. And it's called Seva Exchange. I wish I had a slide that had it, but um, Seva X app. Can we write it on some? No, there's no. Can we write it up? Is there a whiteboard? Is there? Oh, yeah, there's a whiteboard. <laughs> there's, nothing, there's nothing to write with. If you go to the back one. Oh. Okay. That'd be easier. Okay, it's Seva X app, so S as in Sam, E, V as in Victor, A, X, A, P, P, dot com. If you do that, you can create your community, and that could be the name of uh, your product or your, your mailing list of people. You can invite them and then have the people who are excited about your startup um, and, and maybe even gear it to those people initially the uh, excited people, the, what are they called? The risk takers are the ones that, you know, are the first to use your product. Invite them and then they can help you. Just like, uh, what is what is those, um, uh, now I'm like blanking on the, the thing where people bid money. For oh, auction. No, 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 no. They give you money uh, for your product to build it. Oh, oh crowdfunding. Thank you. It's, there we go. it's kind of like crowdfunding, but Sound it's crowdfunding. Much. <laughs> so yeah, save the exchange. Uh, .com would be the actual corporate one, but savexapp.com is where you can, uh, yeah, create your own community and you can get your crowd that way and then move it over to the crowdfunding later. So, thank there you. There you go. <laughs> Good job. I didn't recognize it with a mask. There you go. All right, so uh, we're going to have our first presenter. It's going to be three minutes with slides followed by five or so minutes of uh, torture, I mean feedback from Gary. Yeah, there we, are we going to swap mics? Are they going to use that mic? Or, they're going to use that one, okay. Uh, and here's our timer, so pay okay. attention. Okay, I'm going to get out of your way. Let's give it up for no GPS. Applause. Yay! So if you, are you going to use the slides and move the slides? You can, that's enough. That's the, that's the, first, that's the only one you need? Only okay, let me get out of your way. I don't want to steal your thunder here. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Whoa. Uh, Gary told you the difference between invention and innovation. And he said that uh, inventors cannot be, be startups, but there are always, he's right, but there are always exceptions. So I am the exception. I am an inventor, and I am also a startup, and I am an innovator as well. My invention is a small chip, which you put on your battery, which will be put on the battery, and it will know the location all the time. You don't need GPS. And because GPS is very old, it's obsolete. It was invented 50 years ago. 
when there was no technology actually it was a stone age of technology so my uh, my my invention adds uh, ai and mems which is micro electronic machines so together it estimates the geolocation that's it sensor actuated deep learning neural network to estimate geolocation and then you don't need to ask anybody and that's my and it will be a small chip for two dollars which will be put on the battery and it will know all the location all the time inherently without asking anybody thank you very much is that all wow that was way within three minutes you still had two minutes left okay that was pretty good okay you can ask questions oh i will being the shy person that I am. Ask questions because this is uh, a university. And uh -huh. you should ask questions. Absolutely. So let me ask you a couple quick questions. One, so I know what you do. How do you make money? Yeah, uh, oh. licensing. Hmm? Licensing. All battery. Okay. I'm all battery manufacturers. Oh, that's okay. Corporate. That's a good answer. I can buy that. You just didn't tell me. So I got my answer. Good enough. The qu next question. Where are you in your where are you in status? Go there. Hmm? Yeah, go there. Do you want me to go there? Oh, do I have to sit up here? Oh, man, really? Wow. Oh, man, sitting at the wrong. Okay, I'll stand up here. I'm... Not a problem. Yes, okay, so I was doing that there so I could get you three minutes if you actually got to your three minutes. Okay, so licensing. So um, what's the status of your company? What's the stage of your company? Where are you? Proof of concept. Proof of concept. A big thing, but we want to have a very small thing. That's, no, that's okay. Just one question. So as an example, when we're pitching, Normally, if you're pitching, you're always going to have a very confined time. It's probably going to be somewhere between three and six minutes. So if a person asks the question, what stage are you, um, just answer the question. Yeah. And then we'll try to get to the next question. What happens is I know you have a million things in your head, and as soon as you start, it gets you going and so forth, but you're always going to be limited to time. Well, since you have a lot of time, we've got plenty of time for Q&A here. So, so anyway, okay, so that's the stage of your company. So tell me about your team. Oh, I have got persons working for me for the last 10 years. They are my team. All right, so you've known your team for 10 years. Yeah, okay, yeah. That, that's a big plus. It's not a team that you met yesterday at the bar. <laughs> Although I've had that before. Yeah. Anyway, um, not that they couldn't be a good team, but that's generally not the starting place. Uh, anyhow, so, uh, okay, so those are some of the key things you would like to know. What do you do? You know, I got that part. Um, so what you're telling me is we believe the future of GPS is MEMS. Yeah, MEMS. And Very good. Now, yeah. now you have a future statement. Now, so how do you see the, where's the opportunity? And is it just GPS or can your MEMS technology be used for a variety of things that might do a GPS function but be invisible to the function that it's doing? Does that make sense? Yeah, defense uh, will need missiles and all those things, airplanes and robotics and all those things. It, they all need location. They do. They do. They, yep. they don't have to. Okay. All right. So, so that'd be the good thing. Now, we're in a room full of people, so I wouldn't expect in this kind of environment to someone talk about the details of their product, what their margins are, what their cost of goods sold would be. But if we were in a private room, I would ask him, how much is, what's your cost of goods sold? How much does it cost you to build one of these? What's your margin? And because if you're telling me you can sell them for two dollars, and that means you're making them for at least twenty-five cents. Yeah, something like that. It should, something it like should, that. It should, okay. It should, it should be. It should be something like it that. It should be. It should be something like that. That's right. But the thing is this: that we will have so many uh, sold. Oh, every oh every love day. that. He's already has so many sold that. Okay. We will but, have so many sold. I like the attitude. Yeah. That's good. That's why we, we will make money. We'll make a lot of money because we. Every battery operated device will be a smart Ah, device. okay. Even a dog. Okay, so let's talk about that a little bit. So I love what you're doing. I think you're absolutely headed in the right place. You're heading for low cost because they're going to need these things wherever they're at on the edge computing so everything knows where it's at. Okay, now, I worked for a program. In fact, the last big contract I had before I actually shifted all the way over to fully working with startups was building trucks that don't blow up to roadside bombs. Kind of a big problem in parts of the world, okay? We were forced to build those at an, unre an unbelievable rate. We delivered 2,200 of them in 18 months, and we'd never built a truck before. And each one of them was $600,000 a piece. Okay? Every one we sold, we lost money on. Volume wasn't helping us. We were just putting a check in more trucks that we're selling. Okay? So the, the idea of volume. Now, we had advantage that that was a government program, which they came back and reimbursed us for the $200 million we spent on our own money to get those trucks delivered in the time they wanted. But the point is, as an investor, I get really nervous. Well, we're going to make so many, uh, sell so many of them, that's why I'm going to make money. 
If you lose a penny on every one, then more won't get you there. <clears throat> so, but volume will bring things down, all these things, and MEMS should be really, should be really inexpensive. And it should be cheap, that's the whole idea of MEMS. You do a lot in a cheap environment, low power, yada, 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 all that good stuff, right? So I agree, so your future is, the future is gonna be MEMS, outstanding, and here's how we see that market, and here's where we see it going, here's how we're gonna make money, and boom, boom. So you were good on what you do, but you, you stopped at that. Yeah, I give you an example. A talking doll. Oh, no, no, not an example. I, I, I know what you do, but I wanna know more is about how do you make money, what your finances yeah. look like, what your team look like, what's this data? I'm coming at you. Know. No, 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 no coming to that, no coming. We're done with the product. I'm, so remember, you're not selling me a product and a dog and, and all these things. You give me an example, we know what you do. So, but I know you're going, I'm just giving you a bad time because when we ask questions, entrepreneurs always want to revert back to the product because that's what they know, that's what they think about eight hours a day and it's the natural thing to do and in reality, 99% of the time, it's not what we want to be talking about. Uh, actually, you haven't, uh, I haven't told you about the use cases actually. I'm not well, but that. it's MEMS. I'm an investor. That I understand MEMS. Yeah, I worked in MEMS for 20 years. How big it is going to well, be? Well, I, I worked in it for 20 years. I know how big it's going to be. I know where it's going. But that's it. You're talking to an investor who understands that in, to a degree. And I understand how you're applying it. But you're not here to decide. There's a lot of applications. Things like robotics and, and things like what you're doing in MEMS. And some of these areas are what we call the target-rich solution. Robotics people love to come to us and tell us all the 4 million things that their robot could do. The use cases are endless, and we always say, great, what are you going to do? What's your business? What are you doing? How are you rolling? What, what are those million things are you going to do or are you doing first? There are certain environments that are just target rich. MEMS is a target rich. I worked in MEMS in 2000 when they first started coming out, and we were putting them in everything DOD. Mm -hmm. So there you go. All right, good job. Anybody have any questions for them? Any question? Yeah, university. They should have questions. Come on, where's the MEMS experts? What's your competitive advantage to, like, say, GPS technology right now? Like, why would someone prefer your product over what's already been, you know? Yeah, the, the, the competition costs $10,000 minimum to $70,000, and ours will be $2. That's the, that's the advantage. So are you looking to market at, you know, like, a like global level to, like, companies where, like, companies are controlling GPS and then putting in these products like iPhones and stuff like that, or are you looking to sell it to individuals? No, 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 no. Companies, companies, individuals. Edge computing, think of edge computing. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's uh, Ed manufacturers, battery manufacturers. Yeah. Battery manufacturers, even a toy doll will have our technology. Okay, yeah. Because it will. Well, no, no, they will have possibly a MEMS technology. We're, if we invest in you, then we're betting it's you. Yeah, I mean, the same thing, you know, because a toy will know the location and it will talk Chinese. Okay, China. But, but, but let me go back to this question here now. As a CEO, my, my, my one guidance to you is to don't talk about the product so much. Don't make every response get you back to selling the product. Okay, well, I, I, I saw your point, you know, but they are... Uh, 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 no, no, don't do it anymore. Don't do it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> they are academic people, you know, so they, they are different. So I'm trying to educate them because they know what is AI. Oh, that's good. I'm they just... know what is MEMS. They, they are, they are students. How many people in here under, know what MEMS are? Oh, there's more hands than I thought. Okay, okay. Get two. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I'm done. And, uh, thank you. Good job, though. Good job. I'm, full, I'm fully on board. Yeah, low, low power MEMS. Yeah, exactly. Low power MEMS. Yeah. Yep. Um, Saeed said he sent you slides. When? Right now. Right now. Just now? Yeah. Let's see if you can pull out. So, uh, we did you send it to me? I don't even have my computer open. Let's see if it came up. Well, I don't have my, my computer's not on. Okay. That's not my computer. So we have one more. Uh, we have one more pitch. Uh, we'll take five of the break. Anyway, uh, thanks for talking. Does anyone have any <coughs> questions about uh, what they've heard so far for Gary or our events? Oh. Let's see. Excuse me? Would you have five, ten minutes up? Sure, I can hang for a little bit after the man. I was looking to see if I could pull it up and maybe we could share it off my from my phone. Just log in your email there. Log in my email. It's like you can't get in my Outlook. 
Gmail. South oh, he sent it to my Gmail. South so that's not South Valley. That's that's oh. that's an Outlook. From, I can't get to it from here. I, if I had my laptop, I could, but. Uh, oh, you got it? Outstanding. Okay, we're good. We're good. Well, that's the last thing. Otherwise, let's wrap up a little bit. Either way. Nope. He says he's got it. He's popping it up. I see, I see a screen change. Orbital. There you go. Okay. So if you. All right. Well, let's give it up for Orbital Anomaly. Applause. Hi, uh, I'm Guy from Tide. Um, uh, I'm an aerospace engineering student uh, here at San Jose State. And uh, uh, I wasn't planning on uh, pitching for at least two or three months, but then I saw this advertised yesterday and I figured, what the hell? Better to have a crappy version one and then iterate, right? So, um, so orbital anomaly. Uh, so, next slide. Someone doing the slides on it? Hmm? Oh, it's going to. Is it? No. No, that's a power Okay, so um, to context, <laughs> I'm going to start with the problem. So uh, space has always been incredibly expensive. That's why almost no one goes there, despite many people wanting to go there, wanting to work there, wanting to travel there. Um, SpaceX is massively reducing the cost of getting to low Earth orbit. But what's needed now is to massively reduce the cost of staying in low Earth orbit. Uh, there's probably about, what, 30 or 40 people who've, uh, there's 600 people who've ever gone to space. And sort of long term, right now, there's like, nine people in orbit, right? We need a lot more people going up there in order to actually uh, advance science there. So uh, we aim to build cheap, safe orbital habitats, uh, aiming to put maybe up to 100 people in space concurrently by 2030. And 10 years later, who knows? Next. Okay. DIY. Gotcha. Um, uh, I think it's still up there. Yeah, here it is. There you go. Thank you. Which button do I press? Uh, the right, uh, right, 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 right. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, so yes, cost is why we can't have nice things in orbit. Um, the International Space Station cost $100 billion. The proposed uh, replacement, or one of them by Axiom, which has a contract with NASA, uh, the proposed uh, cost is $3 billion. We think it's possible to build it for another two orders of magnitude cheaper, around $50 million to, that would house five people who can live and work there. Okay, so it's laggy. Sorry, let's go back. I feel your pain. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, so uh, why is space so expensive? Well, there is a good reason. Launching to orbit and uh, getting back uh, without dying on re-entry is really hard. So for 70 years, almost all of that 70 years since we've had space travel, the only way to do it was disposable, and that's like throwing away a plane every time you make a trip. Uh, that's what's so expensive. Uh, we still don't have a uh, fully and rapidly reusable launch system, which is the key to massive reduction in launch cost. SpaceX is working on it, and this is why now we think this is the time to try and uh, build uh, low-cost habitats uh, in order to make use of that launch capacity. All right, I am running out of time here. I feel like you get more time for technical issues, but okay. Um, so I said the good reason is technically hard. What's the bad reason? Look, okay, apparently I'm out of time. Oh. Okay, I'll fill in the blanks. Yeah. <laughs> so I suspect you're in the concept phase. Yes. Wow, well, I saw that coming. Okay. Now, I don't disagree that the problem, that there's a cost issue, but it's not stopping anybody, so nobody cares in this market. So, but as it goes commercial and it becomes for profit, then it will change. Right now, for most of the people up there, either trying to prove it or it's non-profit, that'd be NASA and the government. Fair enough. So the real question of cost is good. So one, one of your bullets is cost. I can buy that. The real question then, and, and, and I know where you're at from, a perspective, from, from where you're at, um, what do you think your timeline would be, you know, if you got, you know, not going to talk about funding matters, but what do you think your timeline would be to develop and get something ready to go up and do a first launch test? Uh, so first launch test, so two to three years. Two to three, okay. So that means it could be 100 to 130% change there. So anyways, two to three. Okay. All right. Still fairly short for something like that. Now, 
you can talk about all the complexities and technical difficulties to get up there. The pro and, and that's true. That, but that, that addresses everybody in the market space that's trying to play in there. So what, let's assume that you've accomplished all the basics that everybody has to accomplish in order to play in the game. Fair enough? Yeah. Okay. So now what makes your um, environments or what you're doing different than somebody else who may already also be competing? Again, we're going to talk product a little bit here because we need to understand that be, uh, to a degree. So, uh, I mean, the main competition is uh, incumbent players. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what you'll find sort of in the history of... Uh, oh, no, I'm talking about history. What makes your next generation product going to be what the next generation product's going to want to be? A lot of it is a change in uh, the way you do engineering management and the way you do product development. The, the way it's always been done by NASA, by large um, aerospace corporations on big government contracts uh, bakes in a ton of cost. And, the rest of the presentation talks a little bit about that. That's right, because the cost of space certification is off the charts. Right, but it that, is. I worked with Space USA for 10 years. We provided the, uh, we, we delivered the heads-up display that they landed every space shuttle its whole life with. So let's split this into two parts. Is it possible to do it cheaper? And then why us, right? So do, dealing with the first part, 20 years ago, if... So but you're not, we're not competing with 20 years ago. I understand. No, How about, to, just talk about today. How, what's going on today? Let me finish the sentence. 20 years ago, if someone was to say that you can build uh, launch vehicles uh, for about 20 to 30 percent of the incumbent, you would have said it's not possible. No, I'd have said, well, I would have said we already have the space shuttle. We already did that. No, but it wasn't cheaper. That was it was cheaper than the launches they were doing in, that, in April in, in, in the 60s. It, it turned out that that was why it had to be retired, because the ongoing cost was so much. Ah, but uh, they're old. They, they never built new ones. We're actually, were actually cheaper. For a, I mean, that's why the Russians never launched their Buran again, because that was a sort of the Russian uh, space shuttle. The reason they sort of didn't fly after about the second time was because it turned out to be cheaper to keep using the, what they already well, had. Well, they quit flying up there for anything, period, almost. But anyway, but point being, th uh, here's another example. So he's talking about a specific market. But what he's giving me are the, the problems that every single person in this market has to solve. So by, by, by them getting solved. So an example of that would have been when clean tech came out. Investors were investing in everything clean tech. Oh, if it, if it was solar panels, we were investing. If it was hydroponics, agriculture, we were investing. If it was this. So I'll use hydroponics. So the investors, the startups come up and say, our system is 92% water efficient. We can grow lettuce in 30 days where the field crops take 120, and they give you all these stats. You go, wow, that's amazing. That's hydroponics. Every hydroponics does that. Not just them. Well, the investors were buying it because, oh, my God, this is amazing. Then they invested in this company to realize that everybody in this space gets 92% water efficiency. Everybody can do lettuce in 30 days. They, the reason they bought it were the wrong reasons. They bought it for the reasons that the technology brings. Anybody that gets up into your space and is successful is going to do it at a lower cost, and they're going to, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to be that thing, or, or it wouldn't be what it is. So now the real question is, are we buying the right low cost? History of it. But I'm not talking to history. I purely look in the future. I, I, I'm going I'm to play the 22-year-old millennial and say, I don't care what happened in the past. I care what's going on in the future. That's where it's all at. But you need some basis for reality, right? So why? The fact is, why, why do I need it? I, I, I live in a non-basis reality. <laughs> so if SpaceX, why is it that Lockheed Martin, United Launch Alliance, Boeing, why is it that they still cannot match a startup, what was a startup company, SpaceX? That's a, different, that's, a, that's a different problem. I work for Lockheed, and I've worked for Boeing, and i worked for SpaceX, and I can tell you why. Because they're, to do anything, the books that define their policies go from that wall to this wall. They don't do anything without a detailed and depth process. But why? Because they've learned that that's important, and that's why it costs a gazillion dollars to build it, and that's why SpaceX and those companies that are coming out can do it so much cheaper because they don't have those same things. But you're absolutely, you're absolutely right on that process. So, but, but at the end of the day, what I really wanted to make sure was that you're, 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 you said earlier, I believe you said it was program, program management, right? That you're re that's really your core secret of a new way of managing it. So in the 90s, that was integrated product development teams. Right. Ooh, then it was TQM. Then it was, anyway. But um, so, so again, that's what you want to highlight up here, not necessarily, it's complex to get to space. Everybody knows that. So you don't have to spend five minutes on the complexities of that. And now I'm done. I can't talk anymore. <laughs> Thank you. But good job. It's, you're in definitely a space that's coming. Literally. So are you familiar with USA, Space USA? No. I mean, okay, they're the ones that actually took it over the commercial side. And locally here, you have space angels that invest only in space projects. Okay. Just for reference. 
It's here for sight. All right. Any, any questions from the audience? We're done. We have another. We have another. Ah, we have another. If anyone wants to talk to me about this project, let me know. Uh, yeah. when's, the first, when's the first ride? <laughs> we have another person wants to pitch. She just emailed, she just emailed them to you. Okay, did, did, did you get them, Tim? Him or me? Gary and South Valley Angels. All right. Well, but I don't, I don't have my computer. That's not my, my computer's not on. Forward it, just forward it. Forward it to who? Uh, to Tim? To Tim? Uh, well, actually, while we're waiting for that, uh, you can entertain some questions. I'll take yeah. a few minutes to line up. So. I'll give you, I'll throw a bonus. You got a few Any questions for Anomaly? Who am I looking for? What, what's the email I'm looking for? Huh? No, no, not that. Who sent it to me? I mean, I've got 500 open, non-open emails here. <laughs> that, that, casual afternoon. What's the project? It's just Danusia. Huh? Danusia, I guess, message. It's the South Valley Angels, right? Yeah, South Valley. I went for 10 slides, but you saw I got through three. So, um, the oh, I have my, uh, just to build I turned off my airplane, that's why I wasn't there. Word for a small space. I didn't want it ringing your stuff. Okay. It'll hear in a second, and, uh, though. Part of what would have been in the presentation there would have been the fact that launch is really hard. Not the screenshot, the second. I'm just going to forward it. Yeah. I'm going to forward it to his computer. Making a metal box okay, that keeps not reply. Air and water in and keep rocks out is not hard, right? You just go and stick it in there. You know, we've known how to make submarines for a long time. We know how to make, you know, aircraft that are sort of uh, airtight and can sort of maintain a pressure yeah, differential. Well, speed, speed and so message. these are well, you know. We'll get to there. Uh, go ahead, send. Sorry, I didn't hit press. Yeah, so not send. Our industry around the world. We okay, it'll be there in a second. Build a pressure vessel of the same size that you could launch in uh, Starship for two hundred thousand dollars. You know, there's a lot of margin there to add in your life support, add in your propulsion, all of those things, on orbit propulsion, and still get to sort of, you know, 50 million for something that would be comparable. Can I get high speed internet? Hmm? Oh, of course. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm in. Starlink, they're working on that. Thank you. Right. I guess that is it. Thank you so much. Boom, there we go. Okay, so we have another presenter, uh, Noral Stellar and Dan. Yeah. Dan. All right, uh, let's give it up for Noral Stellar. Thank you so much. Uh, so, hi everybody, I'm Danushya. I'm the co founder of Neurostellar. We are a neurotech startup building the future of personalized well being. Uh, so, from India. I'm not even. Okay. So we are building something called the Orbit, which unleashes your true potential by uh, like helping you train with your brain. It helps you reduce your stress, track focus levels, and also help you form measurable habits. So this is like any other uh, body tracker, like glucose trackers or, uh, or any physiological trackers, but it tracks your brain activity to help you get better. It doesn't change. Oh, you have to kind of get behind it and, and smile at it. So point at the computer? Yeah, point at the computer, yeah. So the computer is over there, it's not the actual screen over there. Right. No, I'm not able to do it. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. So we are currently focused on one of the most important problems that everyone faces right now, that's stress. And we cope up with it with different uh, methods, but one thing that we're not focusing and uh, we want the future generation to focus on is to be consistent with what they're doing to reduce stress. It might be a positive habit like meditation or forming yoga or something, but um, we want them to be consistent and that's exactly what we're doing and we're gamifying the whole process. Can you move to the next? Yeah, so we are using a technology called this neurofeedback that helps uh, uh, we, us achieve that. Can you move? So uh, this is the exact product. Uh, it has a headband and also an application. It has 1,000 plus contents uh, associated with it that could help you train better. And uh, it also gamifies the whole process with rewards as such. 
So current targets are corporate well-being and also sport clubs. We are into the B2B space and we also have a B2C interest from everybody because it's a product for everyone. Can you move to the next one? Yeah. So uh, currently we're focusing on the APAC wellness markets, which is a 9.3 billion market and with a CAG of 18.3%. Uh, so the business model is B2B2C. Where uh, it, for the B2B, it's B2C, it's a one time cost and a subscription cost for the um, uh, B2C products. And for the B2B, it's a monthly or yearly subscription. So we differentiate from all the competitors out there with respect to lower affordable uh, costs and all, I mean, affordable costs and also with higher efficiency and also high engagement. And uh, currently, we are in the prototype stages and uh, we are planning to launch the product in 2023. So this uh, product is a futuristic product as it not only has its applications in mental health and psychiatry, but also in uh, neurology. It's a future of education where people can just read with their minds and also marketing and defense is actively using this and gaming as well. So this is our team. It's a multidisciplinary team. Uh, yeah, I'll finish it off. Um, yeah. And with uh, influential board of advisors and uh, some recognitions and uh, we have one vision for the future that's to help humanity understand themselves better with the power of the brain thank you all right all right so i like you finishing with your mission statement it wasn't a vision statement it didn't have any future but it did have a mission so i like that so let me ask you a question okay so it's for stress um you didn't go into any detail so if i do something that's not stressful is it like a shock collar do i how does it is it like a shock collar i mean this thing's connected to my head if i it's connected to your head and it's kind of like reach your brain signals it's kind of a smart watch for your brain well i got that part but what is it doing so it's reading my brain is it is it sending that to google uh, no, it's not doing that. Oh. Uh, so it's sending it to your own mobile application where you could read. So my mobile is happy. Yeah. So so I'm trying I'm trying to get to the point of to the simple aspect of what what methodologies do you use with your device to manage the stress? I mean to do the stress. So for example, a lot of the new technologies are coming out with uh, virtual reality, augmented, and they've always had lights and sound and colors right. that people use. These are methodologies in the past that you have as a competitor. Right. You could have done these things. You could have done things. You could have a couple shots of tequila. You know, you could have done whatever got you to relax and get rid of your stress. But in the future, it's going to be moving this way where we have control over the brain to be able to do. So explain to me how that, what's, what's working. Um, what's your sen what, what sensors are you registering? What, are you, what kind of sensors are you using? Uh, so we are what are you measuring? A technology called as uh, EEG. Okay. So it uh, tracks your brain's electricity. Oh, I know, I know, I got that part. I just wanted, yeah, so you, you didn't really provide any of that. You just said we have a thing on the head and we're gamifying it. Yeah. That's why I thought maybe it's a shock collar. If I choose wrong, it's like, whoa, 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 no, whoa. It has Don't do that again. Uh, contents with respect to meditation, to music, to gaming, and whatever, whichever works for you. And the AI helps it personalize according to uh, what works and what does not work. And okay. uh, helps you form habits in a long term. So that's got exactly it. Got it. it so maybe from a simple perspective, you have a, you're using the EKG to send a signal to your smartphone, mm -hmm. which then takes action, like we talked a little bit earlier. And it does things, and you, does it help you like select whether you should be using music now, or whether lights might be better, or do I pick what I want to do and say, like my phone, my, my smartwatch, I got stressed. I hit my stress button, and it just comes back and says, you're not stressed. Oh, okay, I guess I'm okay. If I am, then I relax, I breathe for a few minutes, and it goes down. I mean, it's moderately, it, it, you know, moderately accurate. If it's high, I probably know it's high. Right. You know, but so, so what, what, is your, what is happening? What's the end action out of yours? So uh, it's kind of like, uh, it's not a wearable like throughout the day. It's you start it with it and end the day with it. So uh, and also it, it helps you form habits. In well, again, I'm not asking the how, what does it do necessarily. How does it do it? So I sell a product, a device to a to a business. They incorporate it into their therapy, and I come in and visit them. Um, and I got I saw the picture, mm -hmm. um, and it measures things, and then. It feeds that out there, and then an action is taken based on what your app says I should be doing. Right. No, you can also personalize it, and also you can choose whatever you want to do. So there are many contents available. Okay, okay. So I still drive the results of my app therapy. You can do that, yes. My stress therapy. Yes. Okay. Okay. Do I sort of just sort of trial and error and see which one works best for me and say, oh, if I'm really stressed, I want to do number two. Exactly. That, that, that's what it's uh, leading towards. Maybe you would think that music actually helps, but rather than music, gaming might help. Well, I've tried to sleep to, you know, yeah. to thrash metal, and I just can't do it. 
So you're right. Sometimes metal, does, sometimes music doesn't work. But you're right. Everything's different for different people. So, okay. That's the way we're talking about personalized future. Okay. So now that becomes a better personalized future. We believe the future of will be personalized and so forth. And that's a, that's a very valid thing. And therefore, you're building an app that's focused around personalization to achieve a given result, which fits in it, and that has a nice flow. Right. And then your goal, at the, your mission at the end is that you, you want to be able to change that and have that happen. So uh, yeah. anyway, so, OK. That's that. So I mean, most of the questions I had a little bit was, I didn't. where, where are you? What stage are you at? What, what's your status? Uh, you in the prototype stages. OK, uh, prototype. Mind you, like you've got something with wires sticking out of it that you're testing yet? No, uh, so we have an alpha prototype that's actually ready to uh, get into a commercial prototype stage. Okay. Uh, then we'll move into the beta sales, as I showed in the uh, projection as well. And okay. We'll be moving for the so let me ask you a question. Why can't I read my EKG on my phone to you operate with your app? Can I do that? Can I just use that, that measure and, and, and operate, or I have to have your device? So with the device, it, it's only with the device you'll be able to measure uh, things. Well, my phone does that today. I can measure today. I can tell you uh, if I'm, I, I can't fix it. I can just look at a number, but. Uh, just I say, uh, like uh, EEG is something that's the brain data, and brain data is only got here, and you, you cannot read it anywhere else in the body. But with respect to EKG or any other heart rate metrics or any breath rate variability and all those things, you'll be able to get it in the fingertip. Yeah. All those things happens, but yeah. Yeah, because it tells me if I'm stressed. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's, that's so my point, being, my point being is, when you're talking about your competitor, some of you might say, hey, all of you have a smartphone. I, I don't use an Apple phone, but I know the Samsungs have had stress tests for like five years. Right. I, I don't know how accurate they are. I've never done it with a sp stress specialist. But the point being is there's a solution that as an investor, I may be saying, well, gosh, isn't it like on every phone? It's been on my phone for like the last three phones. So again, it's not what you're doing. It's not exactly. So I may be a little confused on the market. So keep in mind that you know sometimes just that little piece that says this is critical. This is how it's done. Right. And now I'm way over end. Go He's going to throw something at me a minute. But good job though. Um, you're in a great place. I think stress is definitely a way to go, and it matters to catch it because the reality, you know, the future is now sitting in stress will be what kills you probably. Anyway. Maybe m maybe not in that order. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good job. Yeah. So. I does anyone have some questions? Or? Yeah. Yeah. They're students. They don't do stress. <laughs> <laughs> Will FDA need to approve your device? Right. Uh, no. Uh, we can apply for that, but it's more of a commercial end. It's not into a medical space. So, yeah. It's not prescribing anything. Yeah, it's it, not it, prescribing. It's just suggesting. It's like a massage. So, yeah. mm -hmm. I got a good massage. I'm pretty relaxed now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that's exactly what I was saying. Like, with respect to uh, the most accurate, uh, I mean, stress detector that you would get is from your brain activity. And you cannot get signals. And EEG, the technology that we are using right now, is one of the most accurate ones to do that. And the aura ring or uh, ultra human ring or whatever uh, smart wearable that you're talking about that goes on the wrist, it measures uh, physiological signals with respect to heart rate, breath rate, and it gives you a computed value there but not an accurate measure of stress. So that's only with the brain activity. And you can, uh, th there are medical grade devices as well in the market, but those are very bulky and it's kind of not very sleek for you to use it as a consumer grade. But uh, the technology is evolving and I would say sleep is something in the portfolio as well, yeah. So one of the ways to simplify that is one of your key problems should be accuracy. Because with any sensor, that's always, that's always a problem. Exactly. We were talking early stuff in the government, you know, it was extremely accurate mm -hmm. and $80,000. <laughs> but, you know, so I was like, oh, great. And that's a problem with a lot of medical devices. They have good stuff to do stuff. You got to go somewhere to do it. The pro equipment, you can't just do it at home, put it on and relax. Right. All right. Good deal. Good job. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So uh, let's give it up for all our presenters and for Gary. <laughs> Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, Dr. Anu Basu has a final more remarks. Yeah, well, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Gary. You want to come on up? That was really great. Oh, hang on. So
just want to say thank you very much to uh, Gary. That was really informative and uh, valuable to our students. So, you know. Thank you. And they all pitch. We have various pitching events. We're going to have one this semester as well as next semester. So it's definitely okay. valuable to them. I hope you'll come back and maybe listen to the pitches. Sure. And uh, you thank you. <laughs> that too, maybe that's possible too. And uh, thank you to Rob and IDEA to IPO for organizing this uh, session. I hope we can do some more sessions together. And we have some, like I said, some upcoming events in uh, September and October. And that's a website, they'll be posted there. Um, so please look up if you are interested in coming on September 12th or October 17th. And we'll have other workshops as well. Everything is going to be posted on that website. So thanks very much. Okay. You're all invited to the after party, 8 o'clock, Hyatt Regency Santa Clara. See you there. Thanks for coming. <laughs>